zero. Dire wave. justify the scientific method. Therefore, it itself is a dogmatic religious presupposition.
What's up? What's up? What's up? Welcome. Audio good? Can you hear me? Philo quite. Philo quite. Y'all let the chat catch up. Make sure you can hear me. When is Esoteric Hollywood 2 coming out? Bro, it's been out since December. Been out for six months. Signed copies at Jay's analysis. By the way. Is the sound good? Okay. Welcome y'all to the Sunday edition of Jay's analysis. Bro, asking about my book part two. Part two been out. Allow me to put the link in the chat. Volume is a little low. Okay. All right. Oh, well. The link to the chat right there in the chat. Get yourself a signed copy of Esoteric Hollywood 1 and 2. Uh, let me make sure that my mic's volume is up high enough in the computer settings first. I'm fixing the volume. Aha, that's one. Apple has a tendency to automatically move the volume in the computer settings low. So that should be better. Hollywood decoded to? No. No, there's not going to be a Hollywood decoded to. Uh, it never was a go. They never did uh, okay that. But you can um, come and enjoy movies with me. I just posted my uh, alien analysis or aliens twerk for you to fulfill your licentious pleasures that all you weebs have. We all know why you want to break into Area 51 because of your insatiable lusts and so I made a video for you with aliens twerking I thought it was very funny the first five minutes are very Samuel Heidstein but um welcome to Jay's analysis so the timing was perfect wasn't it to cover the debate between an Orthodox and a Barleyamite. Now, I read this book 10 years ago. I read the debate 10 years ago. And after all of what's transpired in the last few months, the various debates and whatnot, I thought, why not go back and reread this? So I did the last couple of days. And uh, for those that don't know, it is now reprinted under SNUY, SUNY, New York Press. So you don't have to buy the $300 version on Amazon, which actually I gave away to a dude, a Jay's Nelson supporter, Ludwig on Twitter. I didn't realize that I was giving away a $300 book. I hope he appreciates that. <laughs> But actually, the book's 20 bucks. You can buy it at um, SNUY Press on their website. You have to go to their website. Uh, on Amazon, you know, it's like $300 on Amazon. So don't buy that one. Um, it has a good scholarly introduction for what it is. The scholars, of course, don't really get Orthodox theology, but they do their best. Um, and if you read the 30, 40-page introduction, you get a decent... Uh, overview of what the background is why this debate happened now let's talk about that first because in the debate with our uniate person a couple days ago we heard many many times over that uh the franciscans and the scotus are what matter and they prove that the thomistic or in the vein of the thomistic version of absolute divine simplicity is not actually roman catholic dogma why? Because of John Scotus, and he's an accepted theologian. That's not how Roman Catholic dogma works. You can't rewind in time to find somebody in the 7th century, the 4th century, the 13th century, when dogmas later 
become defined in Roman dogma. So it literally does not matter what John Duns Scotus said about a matter that is later codified. Now, he would have, if we had gotten into the debate, he would have said, yeah, but John Duns Scotus is a acceptable theologian in Roman Catholicism. So therefore, any opinion that he has is acceptable. Really? No, that's not how it works. Thomas Aquinas has theological opinions that were later not accepted in Roman Catholicism. Does that mean that because Aquinas is an accepted theologian that any of his opinions are therefore acceptable? No, of course not, because that's not how the Roman system works. How often do, do the Roman Catholics tell us this? Constantly. They constantly tell us that the reason that we need the Pope is because there's no way to discern the dogma from opinions. And what do many of the Roman Catholic theologians, especially those in the Uniate circles, wants us to believe. Oh, much of this, you see, is just in the realm of opinion. But as I've always argued, for many years now at least, not always, always, but many years now, uh, the doctrine of divine simplicity in the West is not just a doctrine that relates to propositions about the simplicity of the divine nature. It's the founding presupposition that infects the totality of the Roman Catholic worldview. So if my thesis is correct, it's not just a matter of finding the Council of Rhymes saying that all of the attributes are equated to one another, which is what Denzinger says in that quote in my essay I show. It's also a matter of looking at the other implications of that doctrine. That's always been the argument. That's not some new thing I've tacked on, as our opponent said the other day. It's always been the argument. In all the essays that I've been writing, there's dozens of these essays, dozens of papers, countless talks. And so, therefore, it's not just a matter of looking at what the propositions are in Denzinger about divine simplicity. Now, we do do that. We start there. We look at the different propositions about simplicity, and there's five or six that are explicit in Denzinger about that from the early on all the way up until uh, Vatican I statement. But that's not all that we do because that's not all the doctrine of simplicity in the Roman Catholic scheme relates to. You see, it also gives their Christology a specific approach and a specific series of statements, a set of statements. Because... Divine simplicity affects, obviously, necessarily, how one will view the Incarnation. How is it possible that one hypostasis of the Trinity becomes incarnate and not the entire Trinity becoming incarnate? So we have to have a theology that allows for the possibility of one hypostasis, one person in the Trinity, the second person, the Logos, entering into a mode of being, a tropos, that the other two persons, the Father and the Spirit, do not. Now, ultimately, Roman Catholic theology, in its doctrine and statements of simplicity, especially in Thomism, does not really coherently allow for the second person of the Trinity to become incarnate. Do they believe and confess that he did? Of course they do. Of course Aquinas says many true things. Of course Aquinas thought that the Logos became incarnate. That's not the argument. The argument is not what he thought. The argument is not, did he at times confess true things? The argument is that he confesses conflicting things. Two different arguments. Very simple. So if we equate attributes and persons, if we say that the Son is the equivalent to the will of God, if we say that the Son is literally identical to the energies or the essence of God, which Roman Catholic theology does say, we can't also in another book of the Summa or in another place, turn around and say, but he's also truly distinct and he became incarnate and not the Father, not the Spirit. Because if the distinctions are real, and they are, then from the outset we don't have a problem of assuming that distinction entails composition or division. And this, when we go through these arguments with these people, that's consistently what they come back to. There cannot be a distinction between God's essence 
and his activities or his energies, because that would lead to composition in God. That would mean God has accidents. Well, no, he does not. And we don't say that. For John of Damascus, when he argues for the uncreated energies being distinct from the essence, he does not think of them as accidents in God. Right? God is not cut up into substance, an accident. And if we read the philosophical investigations, the, 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 uh, excuse me, the, the fount of knowledge, he explains this. He also states in the defense of the Orthodox faith that God does not have substance and accident as if he was composed. However, the uncreated energies are not accidents. They are uncreated energies, you see. So we constantly will see the clever word games and tricks that the Roman Catholics play to get around these facts. And what I wanted to bring up with Scotus was that John Don Scotus dies when St. Gregory Palamas is a child. St. Gregory Palamas is a kid, a young child, when John Don Scotus dies. And then after the controversies of the Middle Ages, particularly the debate between a Barleyamite and Orthodox, we have the clear parting of ways, you see. There's a development to these things. This debate shows you the development. And what path did the Roman church take? There's no disputing this. Clearly, they took the Barleyamite path. <laughs> Any Roman Catholic theologian that you talk to today will argue the Barleyamite positions, even if he doesn't know who Barleyam is, because it's eventually codified into their dogmas. It's not just codified in the statements about what simplicity is, you see. And that's why this debate is not just about what simplicity is. What does St. Gregory Palamas say towards the middle of the debate? He says the real difference between you and I is that for us, grace is uncreated, and for you, grace is a supernatural creation. The Roman Catholic dogma is that grace is a supernatural creation. It is not an uncreated grace. That's why in the debate with Luke, I listed the four statements directly from the first four statements in Ludwig Ott about what grace is. Now, a Roman Catholic at this point will typically say, yeah, but he, he, grace is cause and caused. Okay, It's cause and effect, right? All that means is that the effects are created. God himself is uncreated, and you as a creature receive the effects of grace, and therefore that's all it means. No, 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 no. That's not all it means. You see, because in Trent, in the anathemas of Trent, under justification, it says that the righteousness that you get is not the righteousness that God has. If you read Lagrange's commentary on Aquinas, specifically when he talks about grace, he says it is a supernatural creation. It is not the essence of God. We are speaking of the grace itself. We are not talking about persons, the created the creatures who receive the effects. We're not talking about God himself. We're talking about the grace itself. What is it? This has been answered in Roman Catholic dogmatic theology. That's why Ludwig Ott lists four statements. There's many, but the first four make this point very clearly. Grace is a supernatural created accident in the soul. Hence, this debate goes to many different areas. It's not just a debate about propositions about divine simplicity. It's a debate about Christology. It's a debate about the beatific vision. It's a debate about how the human nature in Christ is affected by the divine person assuming it. This debate literally goes to all the places that you hear me go. You think that I make these things up. You think that I'm just saying this stuff. No, no, no. It's all right here. And rereading this after 10 years, just like a few months ago, we reread St. John of Damascus, Defense of the Orthodox Faith. We lectured all the way through it. And two or three years before that, we lectured through uh, Fount of Knowledge. Everything that I've been saying is correct. Um, I'm not wrong. So let's get into this work itself. Oh, but so to sum up in response to uh, the chief objection to our debater last time his chief argument was that you've changed your position because at one time you said that Thomism is the Roman Catholic dogma of simplicity yes and no okay so on the one hand 
not everything that Thomas says is dogma. We all know this. We all admit this. And even in divine simplicity, okay, you could argue that not every statement that, that Thomas says is the dogmatic definitions in Denzinger. No, that's true. But if we want to understand the import and force of the argument, it has never been about just claims relating to what simplicity is. That's only one part of the argument because this is our starting point. This is two different ordo theologiae, right? The West has a different ordo theologiae from the East. Now, the easiest way to disprove what the Uniate was saying was to simply point out that it cannot be the case that two rival theologies right here, which anathematize each other, can for centuries be in opposition. And then after the ecumenical period of Vatican II, suddenly Gregory Palamas is a saint now. This is absurd. That alone shows you that Roman Catholicism cannot be correct. Because it cannot say at one time for many centuries, Palamism is yoga or Hinduism or whatever nonsense they come up with. And then after Vatican II, suddenly because of ecumenical interests, oh, you're acceptable. Right? Oh, well, for many centuries, Uniates just ignored Rome on purgatory, on how they viewed Palamas, how they viewed the energies, and now it's acceptable. There's no midway between grace being a supernatural creation and grace being uncreated. They're two mutually exclusive positions. And in orthodoxy, it's condemned. It's sung in the liturgy that we anathematize the Latin view that came to dominate after this debate. So in other words, it's never been just propositions that relate to divine simplicity. It's also been about the filioque. Because the Roman Catholic position doesn't understand what eternal manifestation is. The entire argument of the, of the Palamite synods after this that relate to filioque and uncreated energies centers around the statements in the Fathers about eternal manifestation. The modern val the Vatican clarification on the filioque from, from a few years ago still admits the tension between the East and the West on the point of eternal manifestation and on the point of Florence and the double procession. It admits that Florence says that the Son also participates in the Father's hypostatic role as cause. The Son participates in being a co-cause. He's not the principal cause, principaliter, as it says. He's a co-cause. The Son does not participate in the Father's unique property that blends the persons. There's only one cause in the Godhead, as all the fathers in the East say, and that's the person of the Father. There's not a secondary cause in the Godhead. There's not a property that the Father and the Son share that the Spirit lacks. And if Father and Son are a co-cause, which Florence clearly says, and Florence explicitly says that the Father and the Son are a cause not just of the projection of the Spirit, of the eternal manifestation of the Spirit, of the hypostasis of the Spirit. It explicitly says that. And the hints, even the ecumenical statement of the Vatican clarification on the filioque admits that the Eastern and the Western positions are still in tension on this point. I know what I'm talking about. Secondly, as I said many times, you cannot have a doctrine of eternal manifestation without a doctrine of uncreated energies because the eternal manifestation is the eternal manifestation of the energies. That's what the thing means. That's what the statement means. It's impossible to believe in eternal manifestation without uncreated energies. Uh, this is precisely where the Roman Catholics confuse the doctrine. This is the whole root of the doctrine. And that's why I showed you in the second half of the debate the statement from the Papadakis book about eternal manifestation in the Palamite Synods. Now, not just the question of the Roman Catholic doctrines of simplicity in Denzinger, not just the question of Christology and how one person could become incarnate and enter into a mode of being that the other two do not, which again, if, if God is an absolutely simple essence in the way that the Roman Catholics almost always define it, how does one hypostasis enter into a mode of being that the other two do not? This would, would require change and alteration in the absolutely simple essence of God. And as a result, they, all of their talk of virtual, conceptual, nominal, 
logical distinctions would also therefore apply to the incarnation. And the incarnation would then be virtual, conceptual, logical, nominal, and not real. And therefore they would be heretics. But they don't want to admit that. But if they were consistent with their view of God's energies and God's actions in this world being strictly created, that the theophanies are created, they would also deny the incarnation. But the point is that they're not consistent. The point is not, do they say correct things at times? Yes. The point is inconsistency. So not only is there a problem in the statements on simplicity itself, by equating the attributes and the essence, which Denzinger does explicitly, not only is there a problem with Christology and the uncreated energies relation, relating to his humanity, uh, denying the uncreated energies, which deifies humanity, which the Sixth Council explicitly teaches and says, uh, not only is there a question of the filioque and the denial and confusion and not knowing what eternal manifestation is, uh, there's also the question of the created grace, as we said, which they say explicitly and dogmatically is a supernatural created accident, which we deny. There's also the question of the sacraments. You see the same problems across the board. God, rela God relating to coming into the world with the theophanies, God relating to coming into the world in terms of the incarnation, and then God coming into the world through the church, in our ecclesiology and our sacramentology. In the Roman Catholic view, if you really believe in the real presence, then the Eucharist is the essence of God. That is retarded. Nobody believes that the Eucharist is the essence of God, except for Roman Catholics who say that he is, that is the body, blood, soul, and divinity. What is the divinity that's there? Is it a supernatural created accident, or is it God himself? Now, in their praxis, they believe that it is God himself. But if it's God himself, then it has to be the essence of God, does it not? Of course it does. Exactly. We would say that that is preposterous. The Eucharist is not the essence of God. It is not changed into the essence of God. If you believe in absolute divine simplicity, then it has to be the essence of God. The uncreated energies deify and change the elements. That's the Eastern view. Just like in Christology, the uncreated energies deify his humanity, as John Damascus says in Book 3 of Defense of the Orthodox Faith. Secondly, thirdly, sixthly, not just the sacramental issue, but the beatific vision. Uh, Luke ought to know that the beatific vision is 100% dogma in the Roman Catholic Church. There's no disputing that. Nobody disputes that it's dogma. But no Orthodox theologian believes in the beatific vision. We believe that that, that, that is heretical and nonsensical and stupid. Roman Catholic theologians across the board will say that the light of Mount Tabor in Matthew 17, the Transfiguration, is a created light because God's absolutely simple essence, can't enter into time and space. How can that be an uncreated light? Oh, but wait a minute. Scripture actually says they saw the glory of God. Is the glory of God created? No, it's not. John, Jesus says in John 17 that the glory that he shared with the Father before the foundation of the world, obviously that's not created, is what he gives to his saints. That's not created. It's uncreated. There's only two options. There's no mediating term. This is the absurdity of the Catholic positions that they call us uh, a dial, uh, that we have a dyad, that we believe in two gods, an uncreated and a created God. Uh, no, right? We don't believe that the essence of God is a different God from the uncreated energies. There's only one God. God is wholly present in every one of his energies, as St. Gregory says. And we don't think in dialectics in terms of God. If you start to think in dialectics in terms of God, you will be a eunomian. You will be an absolutely simple essence proponent in a eunomian or plotinian sense. And that's why they actually literally have the doctrine of eunomius. <laughs> All right, so let's get into this. Uh, so, uh, Oh, and they also don't have in their anthropology the doctrine of the noose, which is an outworking of divine simplicity. Because if humanity is made in the image of an absolutely simple essence where nature and person are confused in God, nature and person will be confused in humanity. And that's exactly what happens in Western anthropology. Therefore, they have, they have the loss of the doctrine of the noose. They don't believe that man is a tripartite creation body, soul, noose. They believe that man is a body and an intellect. They believe in a dyad, a, a dialectical uh, vision of man, uh, especially after Augustine, of body and soul. And that's why none of them, none of them, no Catholic theologians teach the doctrine of the noose. Now, all of those doctrines, including the recapitulation, which you could throw that in there as well, have been lost in the West. Totally. The West does not believe any of those things. 
Those are all demonstrably the result and intimately tied to and connected to the doctrine of absolute divine simplicity. So when I say absolute divine simplicity, that is all the stuff that I mean. I don't just mean statements in Denzinger that only apply to the essence of God. And if you don't know, Denzinger is the sources of Catholic dogma. That has always been the argument. If Luke had paid attention to the many, many, many talks that we've done, he would see that. We're not just listing. The only reason I have the essay that lists the dogma is about absolute divine simplicity is because that's what that essay is about. All of the other essays are about the outworkings of this theology, theological error in all these other areas. Don't you see? There you go. Now, the scholarly introduction to this work notes at the beginning that the argumentation from St. Gregory against the Barleyamite is from St. Maximus. Of course it is. You've heard me many times quote St. Maximus on the uncreated energies. The apologetic, as the introduction notes, is 100% against Platonism. Yes, thank you. Uh, for the know-nothings who think that Palamism is Platonism, the whole apologetic is against Platonism. You have no idea what you're talking about. How is this theosis achieved? Do we believe that this theosis, this deification is achieved, this knowledge of God, this seeing of God through uh, rational uh, inquiry and ratiocinations? No. The rational noetic faculties of man are a natural faculty. They are created. They're good. There's nothing wrong with human logic, human contemplation, human reasoning. I mean, this book involves reasoning and contemplation and logic. Obviously. This, by the way, is a, another refutation of the piodox, uh, the hyper-pious who don't believe that you should debate or do theology in the sense of, of arguing with or defending the faith against the heretics. Uh, even though thousands of pages of Church Fathers' works do this, many hyper-pious, super-pious people, oh, anyone who debates misses the spirit of orthodoxy. Uh, Palamism is not about debating. Uh, oh, here's, here's a whole debate from St. Gregory Palamas. Total idiocy, total lunacy, stupidity. And really, it's just a cloak for spiritual pride. That's all that is. The people who say that just want you to think that they're super spiritual. And thus, we have to see, then, that the achieving of the vision of God is not a rational exercise. It's not achieved through algorithms. It's not achieved through mastering the church fathers. It's not achieved through the logic of Aristotelian syllogisms. It's not achieved through mastering Thomas's summas. It's not achieved through mastering apologetics. Now, all of those things can be good things, but those are all created things. There's no other, you can't look to another created thing to achieve the uncreated. The uncreated transcends those created things. It uses created things. It deifies its energies, the energies of God, I'm saying. His energies, I should say, to be more precise. His energies, because they are in, in hypostatic, they're not abstract, they're always personal, right? His energies interpenetrate all of created reality. They are not blended with created reality. Created reality does not become the essence of God. We are not pantheists. We reject pantheism. We do not believe that the energies are abstract, impersonal forces out there. No. They are personal, and hence they are in hypostatic, in hypostatized. But the point is that it is only through the correct prayer life, the correct approach to liturgy, through humbling oneself through repentance, that one can approach and achieve the truth. That's the big difference here, right? You cannot attain to the truth through mere intellect. You have to repent to attain to the truth. And that's the first starting point, is that he begins by kind of rebuking the Barleyamites for this platonic rational approach. Again, don't think in dialectical terms. We're not setting reason against God or against faith. We're not saying that. That would be fideism, 
That would be the evangelical error that many Ameridox have adopted, especially converts from evangelicalism who think that we, you shouldn't do apologetics. Oh, well, so John Damascus, one of the, the great theologians of the church, who wrote many, many books on apologetics, is therefore wrong. <laughs> this is absurd. This is just ignorance. Um, and most of the time, the, again, the people who speak that way are actually just cloaking their own pride. They feel that they are superior to doing apologetics or to defending the faith or to any of these things. And so it gives them a, a feeling of superiority to you. It's just a cloak for pride. It's just a, it's just a version of prelust. But no, in fact, you cannot achieve these things through any created energy or created subject uh, substance, created form. The grace of God is uncreated and therefore must come to us through humility, through repentance. It can't be an intellectual vision uh, of some essence or some abstract form or some platonic maze that you're, you're navigating to get to the monad. So we are not Neoplatonists. The beginning point of this whole approach is the rejection of Platonism, the rejection of Hellenism consistently. And that's why in the triads, the very beginning, St. Gregory says that Plato and the Greeks and Platonism are demonic. And some Catholic clown was trying to argue with me, saying that he didn't say that. And after I showed him all the statements in the triads at the beginning where he says that, he just says, well, that's not what he means. No, that's what he says, and that's what he means. Because even the scholars in this work tell you that you can't achieve God through mere reason. And again, many people then make the opposite end mistake of thinking that, oh, well, then human reasoning is itself evil and bad. No, Jesus assumed human nature, and that includes human will and reasoning. Right? So if Jesus assumed it and healed it, it's not inherently wrong. He assumed all of, uh, of the human faculties proper to human nature and thereby deified them and healed them. So you can't then interject aspects into human nature that are somehow inherently evil. Oh, human reasoning is therefore evil. No, it's not. It has to be deified. It has to be transformed. The creations of God show his energies. Right, this is what Basil says in letter 234. We know God through his works in creation. This is why there is an analogia in orthodoxy, contrary to what some heretics say, that there's absolutely no analogia. Uh, that's not true. There is. Um, but Barliam is a heretic because he ends up with the view that, the create, that, that there's a created divinity. And therefore, as the scholars in this note that I've said 100,000 times, the simplicity doctrine that Barliam has is eunomian. Exactly. If you read in the Catholic Encyclopedia what the eunomian doctrine of simplicity is, it's exactly what the Roman Catholics say. <laughs> St. Gregory Palamas says the root of all of these errors is the simplicity doctrine. And it's not a question of Aristotelian dialectics of substance and accident that will determine this ultimately, but in fact, what is revealed ultimately is a question of submitting our intellect and our human pride and our philosophy to what Revelation says. Exactly. So absolute divine simplicity, according to St. Gregory Palamas, rehashes the errors of Arius, the Massalians, who claim to see the essence of God, uh, Eutyches, the Eutychians, and the Eunomians. All the stuff that you've heard me argue. St. Gregory says that we are separate from Hellenism. And so there is a Jerusalem versus Athens at work here. Why do I say this? Because I spent many, many years trying to look at this issue. I'm not saying it's right because I spent many years. I'm just saying that I know what I'm talking about. Uh, the last 10 years have been focused on this question of Hellenism, the patristic era, and the one and the many. So I have a sense of what I'm talking about here, right? Now, we can go, for example, to Dionysius, right? St. Dionysius, the Areopagite. He's the first to really take up this issue after the apostles. And he says that God is both one and many, and he transcends one and many. He says that that does not compromise the unity of God because we genuinely think that he's both one and many, right? We can't 
predicate of God in any absolute sense. And so there is a via negativa or the apophatic way, apophatic theology, meaning that we predicate of God what he isn't, right? Uh, but there's also a valid cataphatic approach, right? We, we can say positive things about God, such as that God is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, right? Because that's what's revealed, right? We start our order of theologia from what's revealed. And this is why Basil, when he's interacting with the Platonic Hellenic idea, he contrasts himself with this Platonic idea by saying, when we talk about the one, we don't say that the one is an it. We say that the one is he. Right? And that constitutes, constitutes personality, personhood, hypostasis. When we say that God is he, we are primarily and principally talking about the person of the Father. Right? This is what Paul says. We read this every Sunday in the, in the, the Thanksgiving and the liturgies. For every good gift comes down from the Father of lights. That's quoting Paul. The creed says, we believe in one God, the Father. So the principle of unity the source of unity begins with the person of the Father. It doesn't begin with abstractions about the essence of God. It doesn't begin with abstractions that come from Hellenism. Now, at this point, when a lot a lot of people get confused, and they'll kind of uh, they will kind of uh, veer off into other areas, and they'll say, "Well, but but John uses the term logos, J. So so clearly, right? Think of a uh, uh, logos, right?" That has to mean the same thing that the pagan audience has in mind. Otherwise, he couldn't do apologetics. So, so when when John and John one says logos, it's the same thing that Marcus Aurelius is talking about. Except it's not. You see, what you will begin to see when you really, really, really study in depth. And, and I've read countless works on this topic. I'm not saying that makes me right, but I mean I've read the entire Pelican series, right? All of the Pel all five volumes in Pelican especially when he talks about this. I've read J.D. Kelly. I've read, you name it. I've read the patristic era treatments of these issues. And I've read most of these fathers themselves on these issues. And Jerusalem versus, versus Athens is kind of at the root of this whole thing. This is the problem. And this is where we depart from the Catholic view, the Roman Catholic view. Because if we look at Marcion, Okay, let's start with the early, early heretics. Marcion sees a dialectical tension, a contrast between the God of the Old Testament, who's mean, and the love God of the New Testament, who's nice. Okay, this is very common today. Okay? Marcion has a presupposition about either or. Right? Either God is the mean God of the Old Testament, or he's this nice God of love in the New Testament. And no, those two things are in conflict, so I'm going to go with the nice love God of the New Testament. Now, this is a stupid approach to theology, and it, of course, ignores many, many clear proofs of the continuity between the Old and New Testament. And so, for example, in Against Heresies, St. Irenaeus has a lengthy section where he refutes Marcion, and he goes to many, many things that prove the continuity of the Old and New Testament, explicitly refuting Marcionism, explicitly refuting Marcion's denial of the historicity of the Old Testament. But that's a beginning point where we start to see a departure between Jerusalem and Athens, right? And I'm, I'm, I'm using those terms loosely. That's kind of a shorthand for the long-term uh, battle between the Hellenic ideas. We're not talking about Greek culture. We're not talking about Greek food. We're talking about Hellenic philosophic assumptions. That's the key here. So don't misunderstand when I'm saying Hellenic errors. I'm not talking about Greeks. I'm not talking about people. I'm not talking about culture. I'm talking about the specific philosophic ideas. So and then when we move into these different Gnostic groups, we see that many of the Gnostics, for example, that Irenaeus deals with in the first 300 pages of his Against Heresies, many of them were infected with these bizarre Platonic views, Platonic theory, many of them, not all of them, but many of them. When we move into the uh, period of the post-apostolic apologists, okay, let's take Tatian. Tatian was early on a student of Justin Martyr, St. Justin Martyr, the philosopher, as he's called, uh, who was an apologist, right, who did use philosophy. But what Tatian did was he got too enveloped by the Greeks. He fell into the dialectical philosophy of the Greeks. And unfortunately, Tatian went into heresy. And then as a result of Tatian, some of his students became... Uh, I believe they were the Incretites, right? 
he, he, many of his students became these Gnostic Marcionite vegans. Okay, that's listed in uh, Jan, John Damascus's Heresiology. It's also, I think, listed by Saint Hippolytus of Rome. But the point being is that when this happens, that group gets into either or dialectics of the Greeks, Greek philosophy. Let's look at, as we move from these clowns into people like Celsus or Origen. Okay, now Celsus was into Greek philosophy. Origen was a patristic writer, uh, influential scholar and church father, but he's not a saint and he's not orthodox, but he was influential. And he was very into Platonism, Neoplatonism. He did not have direct uh, interaction with Plotinus. I'm not saying that, but I'm saying that there's a lot of similarities, okay? And what eventually gets condemned by the Sixth Council explicitly in Originism is his Neoplatonic views, his Platonic views. It doesn't matter what you call it. It's Hellenic philosophy. It's denial of Eden. It's denial of history. Denial of the eternality of the Son in terms of his being eternally begotten. It's, it's a denial of genuine diversity in God at the expense of the unity. So in the question of the one and the many, origin falls over on the side of the primacy of unity and essence in God. And so therefore, whatever is not the essence of God, according to origin, has to be some lesser metaphysical status. Why? Because of philosophic assumptions. Distinction must entail composition or division if it's a real distinction, you see. Now again, many, many, many philosophers, theologians, have written on this topic. What I'm saying is not my own ideas. I'm not making this up. It's not new to me. David Bradshaw, very famous, has books on this topic. If we move in then into the period of Arius, Arius and the Eunomians, right? These two radical groups, they were convinced that if God is one, anything that that is a, is is predicated of God or said of God that's distinct from father or from one has to be some lesser metaphysical status. The son cannot, the son of God cannot be homoousius of the same nature or essence, because that would imply that there's parts, there's two gods, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, right? This is the stuff that you hear Arians today still argue. This is another dialectical Hellenistic idea. Now the Eunomians were more radical. They said. Now, we can actually know the essence of God, and we can make positive predications about the essence of God, and that's why the essence of God is the Father, and, then, and that is defined. It's a definitional notion here. Uh, it is defined as ungenerate, unoriginate, is what Eunomius said. And so St. Basil and St. Gregory of Nyssa launched into gigantic refutations of Eunomius. And guess what they used? To refute Eunomius. Can you guess what distinction they used? They used the essence energy distinction <laughs> to refute Eunomius. If that distinction is not real, the entire argument against Eunomius collapses. This is so stupid. That there's nothing more low IQ than the people who think that this is the same doctrine as Roman Catholicism. That that Palamas and Gregory and Basil, they're not teaching anything different. Uh, then the whole argument <laughs> against Eunomius would collapse. If we move into the period of Nestorius and St. Cyril, okay, Ephesus, another Christological period. Right? If you read McGuckin's book, if you read St. Cyril's own writings, what you start to see is that Nestorius doesn't see how it's possible that there's not some tension between divinity and humanity. There's, there's some tension, so there's, there's a two-ness here that is there's some kind of moral conjunction, moral union between the Son of God and a human person named Jesus of Nazareth. They're, they've got some kind of moral union here, but there's not one divine person. The subject of all the incarnate actions is not the second person of the Godhead, as St. Cyril said. It's, at times, there's this divine Jesus that's shining through, and at other times, it's this man, Jesus of Nazareth, you see. 
This is another version of Arianism. It's not exactly the same as Arianism, but it's another version of Arianism. And it's based on the same dialectics. There's, an op there's some natural tension and opposition between divinity and humanity in Christ. This same problem will occupy the church for the next several centuries, all the way up into the fifth and sixth councils, which deal with the two natures in Christ. The chief argumentation that St. Maximus deals with is against the monothelites, who are people who are essentially kind of a continuation of monophysites, who said that, well, if there's only a unity in Christ, there's only basically this blended kind of thing in Christ when he becomes incarnate, a divine human hybrid, then there has to be one action or energy in Christ. And so what St. Maximus does is that he goes to great lengths, especially in the disputation with Pyrrhus, to prove that the monothelites are wrong and that Christ has two wills and two energies because energy is a property or faculty of nature, right? St. John of Damascus covers this in Book 3 very clearly right, as he launches into a rehearsing of the Christological controversies. And what I'm saying is that once again, right, when he's arguing with Pyrrhus, he accuses Pyrrhus of setting up dialectical tensions between the will of man and the will of God, between Christ's human will and his divine will, between Christ's human energy and his divine energy. He, say, he says he thinks these things are in tension. And the key is to understand, going all the way back to Cyril, and the way Cyril explains it against Nestorius, and the way that the fifth and sixth councils explain it, which is that the humanity of Christ is deified by the uncreated energies of Christ, legitimately raised, but it still retains its natural created properties. Christ's humanity never loses its created status. It will always and forever be created. However, it's not just created and mortal. It is raised. It is deified. Right? It, it, it participates in that uncreated energy, yet still retains its created property. That's only possible. It's only possible to believe that and accept that if you reject Hellenic either or dialectics. That's the key here. That is the overriding consistent principle that we want to understand that we reject. And when we start to grasp that, that's when we start to see that so many of these theological problems, controversies, and debates center around dialectical either or tensions. Now, sometimes there is an either or, right? There's not always a middle ground. This is a kind of fallacy, right? There's not always some, some middle term as if you know, well, for example, uh, theism and atheism. There's no middle ground there. All right, so sometimes there is an either or. But in a lot of the theological controversies over the centuries, Jerusalem versus Athens, right, there is a transcending of either or dialectics. And St. Gregor Palamas is kind of the culmination, you could say, uh, because certainly there's, there's disputes and, and arguments after St. Gregory. But if you follow the logic from Nicaea through Ephesus to the Sixth Council with the Monothelites all the way up through to St. Gregory's Day, you will see a logical train of the development of this theology. And by development, I don't mean the Roman Catholic conception of development where it's um, evolving. Uh, in our view, the development is just a restatement or a redefining, an explication of what's already there. Right? So we quite, quite literally say that we're teaching the exact same thing that, that uh, St. Dionysius the Areopagite said. Uh, we quite literally believe that Basil explicates the same faith as St. Paul. And that's why it is correct, as St. Maximus says, to understand that one thing that the fall did, right? I mean, it, it did a lot of different things, right? The fall of man introduced corruption, decay, metaphysically, morally, right? There's all these problems with the fall. But one thing that it did, philosophically speaking, you could say, was introduce these dialectics where people think that there's hardcore either ors in tension at all times. And it's not always the case. Right? So... The great irony, and this, this was a misunderstanding that I had for a long time about orthodoxy that I had to kind of 
finally come out of. And the key, the key piece of evidence for me in, in being convinced that orthodoxy was not just Hellenism and Neoplatonism was the statement of Basil where he says, for us, the one is a he, not an it. That's when it finally clicked for me that I understood. Now I see why the church fathers are consistently having to battle, whether it's Marcion or whether it's Arius or whether it's the Massalians or whether it's Eunomius or whether it's Nestorius or whether it's uh, Pyrrhus, the Monothelites, Dioscorus. They're consistently having to battle with either or dialectics. And once you understand that, it's very obvious. You see it. You see how Arius says that if God is simple and the Father is God, then if he eternally generates, that cause has to be a created cause because it would compromise the simplicity of God, he says. And Athanasius refutes him by saying that the Son is an eternally generated Son. He's not temporally generated. He's not the first thing that God created. He's eternally generated, and therefore he is not a creature. He shares the same essence of the Father. Is he the direct offspring of the Father's nature? Yes, he is. Right? And the Roman Catholics try to say, oh, that means divine, absolute divine simplicity then. No, no, he's the direct generation of the Father's nature. You see, Athanasius is not setting the essence of God as some abstract preeminent category that we start with. He starts with the Father. And that's why Hebrews says that he is the direct image and icon of the Father. Now, so dialectics then is a consistent problem. And when you read through many of these church fathers and many of the analyses of the church fathers, uh, you will begin to see that as very clearly evident. The heretics will constantly think that there's only either ors, right? Either God is one or he's many. He can't be one and many. Either God is absolutely simple or he's composed of parts. He can't have distinction without division, you see. Now, for us, as we said, there are multiple Palamite synods after these disputes up into the 14th century, and these are the Palamite synods. They're just orthodox synods, and they're received as normative, as I will show you in a moment. We sit, Many churches still sing this, uh, and therefore uh, Palamism is nothing more than orthodoxy. That's why the entire orthodox world, except for certain ecumenists who we will so, show are incorrect, uh, believes in the essence-synergy distinction. Right? This is normative in orthodoxy. Will you find an Orthodox person at times who's confused on this? Sure. But everybody knows what our liturgy says. Everybody knows what our catechisms say. Everybody knows that across the world, the Orthodox Church believes in a real essence energy distinction. Now, it doesn't matter how many Fordham ecumenists funded by giant foundations, all proven, 100% proven now, try to say that there's no distinction between essence and energy and that Gregor Palamas doesn't believe in a real distinction. Of course he does. That's what this whole debate is predicated on. They're liars. They're lying because they're paid to lie. They're not really orthodox. And it's all come out that they're paid by foundations to promote this stuff. The Jesuit University of Fordham. Everything that I said 10 years ago about this kind of stuff has all been proven true. The debate at times does center on the classical tradition. So that is treated of in the... Uh, scholarly introduction, uh, and they do note that St. Gregory Palamas is not completely opposed to classical education or the, tra the classical tradition, right? So let's not uh, uh, mistake what I'm saying for like Baptist type views or like a, a, a independent landmark fundamentalist Baptist church like Jerusalem versus Athens, that means everything that's Greek and everything that's of the church fathers and all philosophy is of the devil. No, no, no. No, he... St. Gregory Palamas was trained in Aristotelian logic. He was trained in Aristotle. St. John Damascus was trained in Aristotle. Right? Read David Bradshaw's Aristotle, East and West. We don't have a problem with Aristotle. We have a problem with the Western usage of Aristotle. Indeed, throughout the Fount of Knowledge, as I've said, like I lectured on the whole book four or five years ago. Mathema ignored all this, of course. Uh, 
all of those Aristotelian categories are used in the proper way in St. John Damascus, and they're used in a different way by Aquinas. Now, <clears throat> when we come to the work itself, understand that this is, this is after the period of the triads. So he's already written the triads. I believe I'm right about that. Go up from memory. And I did a talk on the triads a year ago. So you can go listen to that talk. This is complementary to that talk. Uh, and it begins by pointing out that Barleyam is a heretic. Barleyamite views are heretical. That's how the book begins. Barleyam begins his debate by saying God's actions are identical to his essence. Did you hear me? Exactly what Aquinas said. Not identical in a figurative sense. Identical in an identical literal sense. Actus purus. He is his essence. He is identical to his essence. His actions are identical to he and to his essence. And Barleyam begin, or the Barleyamite says, uh, let's make sure that we... Uh, can support our views from the church fathers, you see. Because in the triads, the majority of the argument in the triads is biblical. And this was another thing that impressed me, was that throughout the triads, it's consistently arguing from the Bible. Now, in this work, we're moving on, and there's going to be biblical references still, but here the debate begins by the Barlamite saying, you better prove your view from the church fathers and from tradition. And St. Gregory responds by saying, okay, uh, but let's keep in mind that every heretic believes his view is proven by the church fathers. Right? This is, this is the, everybody says, I am in, I am in the true succession of the, of the church fathers and the great theologians of the ancient church. Uh, but just claiming that is really meaningless. We have to actually demonstrate that. So it begins by talking about foreknowledge. Okay. And uh, Barley, or excuse me, Palamas says foreknowledge is an energy of God and if we just stop for a moment and think about the stupidity of identifying the essence of God with foreknowledge and with the will of God, then we would come to see that there have to be real distinctions in God. Okay, God foreknowing event, an event, is obviously not identical to God's will. <laughs> obviously. And what argument do you constantly hear me make? Right? What do I usually say? I say, let's look at Christology, don't I? What's the first thing he goes to? Christology. He says, the clearest way to see that there's a distinction between the energies in God, his actions, and what he is in himself, his inner essence, is in the person of Christ incarnate. Because this is God in time and space, walking around, right, doing things. And Christology is key because it shows us that he possesses two wills and two energies. And if we do believe that his actions within time and space are real, then clearly those actions are different. His walking on water is not the same thing as his creating the world. In fact, John Damascus says very clearly in book three that that's an action proper to his div divine power. All the mir miracles are. Of course they are. Walking on water is not proper to human nature. It's an action that that shows, that demonstrates divine power. Is the action of walking on water the same as the action of creating the world and also the same as the destruction of the world? All actions of God, admittedly? Of course not. That would be ridiculous. That's why Basil says in letter 234, if you add up all these attributes and say they're identical and that they're identical to the essence of God, you're a fool. He begins the debate with that. He begins the debate by saying that St. John of Damascus says that the uh, energies of God enter into history. He begins with book one of Defense of the Orthodox Church. How many times have I begun with that? What's the next clearest argument? What does he move to? He moves to the uncreated light in Matthew 17. The glory of God shining within creation the glory of God around Christ in the transfiguration. The light of God 
in the face of St. Stephen, the light of God that shines upon Paul when he's converted. This is the same grace that the saints get. It's the same grace that's uncreated. It does enter into time and space, just like the Theophanies did. And so when Joshua, when Gideon, when Abraham worship these Theophanies that manifest within time and space, are they worshiping creatures? No. They're not worshiping holograms. They're not worshiping created phantasms. They're not worshiping created analogs. They're worshiping the pre-incarnate Logos. So just as it's possible for the Logos to be incarnate, excuse me, pre-incarnate when he manifests as the angel of the Lord and the Old Testament saints bow down and worship and he's given the name Lord, Yahweh, just as he's able to enter into time and space, so also can he become incarnate and so also can the uncreated light that is, that is his divine glory manifest in the transfiguration. Now, all of Roman Catholicism says that the light that manifests in Matthew 17 is created. I have never heard, so I don't know where the uniates or any of that, maybe they could come up with something. I've never heard it because I've never heard a Roman Catholic say that that is uncreated light. Because that would deny the whole of the analogia entis and the, the causal view of how God relates to the world in everything I've ever seen in Roman Catholicism. I have never seen a Roman Catholic theolo theologian say that, that Mount Matthew 17 is the actual uncreated light of God entering into time and space, manifesting for the apostles to see. And yet that's what happened. Now, maybe there's some uniate theologian out there in some university somewhere who, who thinks that it is. That does not translate into the possibility of that existing in Roman Catholic dogma. Let me make another point on that, too, which is a little more practical, but I think is still a, a persuasive argument, which is that let's say that it's true that 99.9% .9 of the Roman Catholic Church does not believe that, and 0.1% of the Roman Catholic Church does hold that, and somehow that's legitimately true, and, and you can somehow hold that opinion within Roman Catholicism, which you can't, but let's say for the argument that you, sake of argument that you can, what does it say for a church that has two mutually exclusive positions, and the supposedly true church has for many, many, many centuries, 99.9% .9 of it held that that light is created, but 0.1% has actually been correct, and nobody else in this church knows it. That's ridiculous. That's, just, that's stupid. So you are the apostolic church, and 0.1% actually knows this very basic doctrine, but the rest of, of the whole thing is, has bumbled on this for centuries? That's absurd. What's more likely the case, right? <laughs> that that it's just two different doctrines, right? That's what this whole debate is predicated on. Now, somebody might say, well, but uh, 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 Barlaam isn't really representative of the Roman Catholic position. Yes, he is. He's perfectly representative of the, of the, the Roman Catholic position because he became a, a Catholic bishop, uh, Roman Catholic, and eventually the views that he holds are 100% across the board what you find in any standard Roman Catholic dogmatic manual. Now, he moves then to an argument that I've made many times. What Roman Catholic would dare say the glory of God is created? In John 17, we have Jesus launching into an extensive discussion, the high priestly prayer, about the glory of God that he possessed with the Father before the foundation of the world, that he shared in common with the Father and the Spirit, that he will give to the apostles. And he clearly, between verses 1 to 3 and then to verse 20, says that it's the same glory. It's not a created analog that he's going to give us. It's not a supernatural creature that he's going to give us. The same glory that he possessed with the Father before the foundation of the world, he says, will be given to us and to the apostles. Is that a creature? Of course it isn't. No more than the light 
of the, man, uh, of trans, of the transfiguration itself is a creature. It is the uncreated light that Paul talks about when he says God dwells in unapproachable light to Timothy. If grace is created and grace is Christ, Christ is, in other words, if we're getting what Christ had, if, if the grace that we're getting is created, it's a supernatural creation, and the glory that Christ has is a supernatural creation, then Christ is a creation. Exactly. And that's how the argument falls into Arianism. Barlium says, well, look, the saints, though, reply to you. This is every Roman Catholic. Isn't this hilarious that every interaction that you have with Roman Catholics and Thomists on this point, and Protestants, too, let's include the Protestants have the same view. Let's not make this just about Roman Catholics, because the, the Protestants, 99.9% .9 of all Protestants adhere to the Western doctrine of absolute divine simplicity across the board in all of their the their theologies, whether it's Charles Hodge or Burkhoff or Bavinck or uh, Calvin or Luther, they all believe in absolute divine simplicity in this same way. All the way up into the Puritans, they say the same things. And what's the next reply that you get from every single Thomist? Ah, but you see, God is one and simple, and the Church Fathers teach that God is one and simple, and therefore you making this distinction, you make God composed. <laughs> of course we believe God is one and simple. But we don't believe that the simplicity and unity of God is compromised by there being a real distinction between the persons, do we? Of course not, right? Father, Son, and Spirit are really and truly distinct from one another. They're not modes or masks that God has, right? That would be modalism. That would be Sabellianism. We don't believe that. That was rejected in the church, right? So when, for example, Athanasius argues with the Arians, he points out that the action of God generating the Son is eternal and natural. It's, therefore, divine, right? It's not caused in the sense of temporal causes. It's an eternal cause where the Father eternally generates the Son. There was no point in time in which the Son was not, right? It's an eternal generation. That eternal generation suggests a real distinction, right? The Father is the unoriginate cause. The Son, the eternal generated Son. That eternal action of generating, which Athanasius does say is an action, is distinct from any action of creating or contemplating the creation, the logi, the exemplars. Right? The sun, the eternally generated sun, is not identical to either of those things. Right? But it is an eternal movement of the Father generating the Son. Cause suggests movement. But it's not a movement that's like the energy that goes into creating the world. Therefore, there's a natural movement, a natural eternal begetting of the Father's nature, which is the Son, and therefore because it's eternal, because he's of the Father's nature, he's absolutely fully divine. He's not any lesser ontological metaphysical status than the father but that eternal generation is an action that's distinct from the action of creating the world right because the world comes to be at a point in time if you don't believe in a distinction between essence and energy and you believe in divine simplicity then the sun is a creature the action of create uh, of generating the sun is like the action of creating the world. What distinguishes eternally generating from creating in time and space? Now, if you have debates with Muslims, they will tell you that God is eternally a creator. And because he's eternally a creator, the sun is a creature. There's no eternal logos. I'm saying there's no eternal logos that's the second person of the Godhead in, in Islamic theology. Islamic theology has this confusing thing about the Quran being an eternal word, I, whatever. Point being is that they don't believe in the Trinity, right? And one of the reasons they don't is because they don't have a problem identifying God being creator 
with God being Father and with the essence. Right? So it's, the, it's essential to God to be a creator. And if it's essential to God to be a creator and God's essence is eternal, then God is eternally a creator. That's what the Arians argued. And since fatherhood is essential, being unoriginate is essential, anything other is a work of God. And if anything else is a work of God, it's distinct from that one essence, that one fatherhood, that one creator. Therefore, the Son is the first creation of God. He's the first work of God. And then through that Son, he created the world. That's the Arian view. But you see, we have to make a distinction between the eternal generation of the Son and that action and the action of creating the world, the essence energy distinction. That's one example of that. And you say, well, Jay, where is this? This is proven to be the argument that Athanasius makes against the Arians if you read the Father Florowski essay. I've cited it many, many times. The whole essay proves beyond any shadow of a doubt that that's the whole context of the Arian argument. And in fact, St. Gregor Palamas will even cite that very debate and then cite St. Cyril of Alexandria using the same arguments for the essence energy distinction. This is baffling to me that the, the, the goofy Roman Catholics come in here trying to use Athanasius and St. Cyril to disprove the essence energy distinction when that's a key linchpin in their argumentation. <laughs> uh, let me add this. So again, we have to stress this. Athanasius' whole argument against the Arians is what I was just telling you. And anybody who reads the famous Florowski essay will know that beyond any shadow of a doubt. Now, point being is that uh, this essay we know that, that this is not just something that uh, Florowski cooked up because it, the same argument is made in here. <laughs> It's not something Florovsky just made up. Oh, let me get clever here and try to prove that Athanasius believed in the essence energy distinction. To no, no, no. It's the, the same argument was made centuries before in in uh, Saint Gregory. So as we move through, then uh, the debate continues by saying, um, barley, barley, um, there's a, the possibility. Well. Uh, maybe that these distinctions are just intellectual. Uh-oh, where have we heard this before? Oh, every Roman Catholic, 99.9% of them, right? Uh, maybe the, the distinctions that we're talking about are just intellectual, um, um, but the intellect can, can see these distinctions, but really in themselves are all the same, because if we, if we thought these distinctions were real, it would mean that God's composed. How many times do we have to respond to the same point? Distinction does not entail composition or division. And if you can admit that the Father is the cause of the Son, as all the Eastern Fathers say, then you already admit that distinction does not entail division or composition. So there should be no problem in believing in a distinction between God's energies, actions, and what he is in himself. And in fact, he says that if you believe, in fact, this is St. Gregory's argument now, he says, if you believe that God is absolutely simple, but that you participate in a created supernatural grace that's also divine, then you make two gods. You have a uncreated God and a created God that you participate in. A created supernatural grace, which is literally what they say. Is that the same as the uncreated? The Roman Catholic will tell you no. If that's not the same, then you have Two gods. You have a created God you worship, and you have an uncreated God you worship. So actually, you are the dyadic polytheists, not the orthodox. Because we believe that the uncreated energies are fully God. The distinction between essence and energy is not a composite God. It's not two gods. Every energy is fully divine. They're not accidents in the, in the Aristotelian sense. God is not substance and accident. 
Yes, correct. He's not composed. But that doesn't mean that differentiation in him is not real. It's not merely conceptual. Are the persons in the triad only conceptual, notional distinctions, virtual distinctions? No, they're real. The Father really does eternally generate the Son. That's not a notional distinction. It's an actual eternal begetting. And that's why the Father, as all the, all, the person of the Father, as all the fathers teach, is the sole cause and monarchia of the Godhead. Next, he moves to the beatific vision. He says that if you believe that you will see the essence of God, you are a eunomian. Exactly. And this disproves Luke and his madness from yesterday, or two days ago, whenever it was. Because Luke says that it's only about what the statements and the dogma are about divine simplicity. No, it's not. It immediately goes into beatific vision. The Roman doctrine of the beatific vision, where you your intellect is finally satiated and you're made happy by seeing the essence of God, is utterly absurd and eunomian. It's the same heresy as eunomius and the same heresy as the Massalians, who said that they saw the essence of God. And St. Gregory then moves into saying, you are now in a presuppositional trap. Did you hear me? A presuppositional trap. Because you have hung yourself on an either-or. And the idiot Roman Catholics say that I make up the presuppositional argument. No, no, this is the presuppositional argument because he's putting Barlium into the either-or traps that Barlium has created for himself. It's not We, we are not in the either-or trap because we deny the dialectical tension of either-or. Right? There can be distinctions in God without composition or division. Barlium says, our intellect rises up to see the essence of God we, first, we must move through this pathway of creatures, and then we, through intellectual vision, like Plato, we can see the essence of God, and, and then in the eternal state, we'll be perfectly satiated, and we won't want to change. We'll be perfectly fixated in a static vision of the essence of God. That is Platonism. That's what Plato said. That's what Origen says. The beatific vision is the heresy of Originism and Plato. Now, the only difference is that Origen thought that in order to retain free will, you have to be able to move your gaze away from that one essence of God, and that that's what the fall is. The fall is your intellect moving away from the singular essence of God and falling then into uh, creatureliness again. No, all that Plato crap, we toss all that out. That's once again, Jerusalem versus Athens. We don't want any of that nonsense. It's not our created intellect that sees the essence of God, okay? Body, soul, and noose are transformed by the uncreated energies. That's the key here. So uh, when St. Maximus discusses the vision that we have, Ma Maximus says explicitly, we do not see the essence of God. What we see are the many logi, the many uncreated energies, in the one logos. Very different. The exemplars, now he moves to the exemplar argument. How many times have you heard me make the exemplar argument? I made it against classical theists, made it against other Thomists, because it's absurd. The exemplars are identified in Thomism and in most of Roman Catholicism with the essence of God. Augustine says this even. But the exemplars of created things, the patterns, principles, and archetypes of all the created things, are not identical to the essence of God. The essence of God is absolutely simple and undifferentiated. It's a perfect unity, right? And so if created things are based in the essence of God for their patterns and archetypes, then all things are no nothing but reflections and manifestations of the essence of God, which is impossible. And thus all, if you're consistent with that, you would actually believe in Maya. You would believe that distinctions in the world are actually illusory because there's no such thing as chairness, right? The chair doesn't have an archetype in the essence of God. The essence of God is not like any created thing. Moses says this, does he not? Right? Not only does Moses say this, Paul says this in Acts 17 when he goes and he talks to the philosophers battling Hellenic philosophy. Acts 17 is completely a refutation of Hellenic presuppositions. He says the divine nature is not like anything created. It's not like gold and silver and things in, in temples. That's idolatry. What does Roman Catholicism say? Creatures are analogs to the essence of God. You're an idolater. Now, I know that they say that 
Yeah, but it's not a perfect analogy to the essence of God. It's not an analogy to the essence of God at all. There's no creatures that are like the essence of God. That's why we are in perfect continuity with Moses. When Moses sees God and experiences God, he experiences the goodness of God. It's made explicit in Exodus. God says, I'm not going to show you my face. It would kill you, but I will show you my goodness. Is the goodness of God created? No, it's not. The goodness of God is uncreated. Go read Dionysius. Next, he begins to say, all right, I'm going to, let's argue not just from the Logi of St. Maximus, because St. Maximus writes at length in Ambiguum 7, which we will cover in part two, uh, on the uncreated energies, the uncreated Logi. He says, uh, creatures reveal to us those Logi, but they're, they're not identical. Creatures are not identical to the exemplars, and the exemplars are not the essence of God. This is very key. And Maximus is unambiguous about that, hence the ambiguum <laughs> number seven, where he covers this issue, the Logi, right? Uh, therefore, it is absurd and stupid to identify the exemplars with the essence of God, which classical theists still does. Uh, then he was on to say that God uh, may have done many other works beyond the works that we know. He has energies that we don't know. Because scripture says he has many, many, many infinite works. We will never exhaust the works of God. And who does he cite for that? St. Basil. St. Basil says God has many, many works, and he has even more works that we don't even know. And I'm sure, oh, you're making up those quotes. Those are all made up. Those are all made up. All of this is referenced, so let's give you the citations. This is against Eunomius chapter 2. To cite uh, Maximus, it is Ambiguum 7, and it is Maximus against Thalassios chapter 13. There you go. Go look these up. Write these down and look them up, liars. You're making those quotes up. Next he moves uh, to, so Barleyon moves on. He says, all right, look. Maybe uh, the, the grace itself isn't created. It's actually uncreated. So Barlium moves his position, and now he says that, no, we really do participate in theosis. We really do. And we're really getting divinity. But that divinity is uncreated. And this is what you'll see the Roman Catholics do. They get so confused, they will literally flip back and forth and say both things. Within the same debate, they'll say the, the same. No, 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 you're really getting a, a supernatural created grace. The grace itself is created. And then like five minutes later, they'll be like, well, you are participating in the divine nature and deification. You're really being deified, and it's, it's the divine nature. Is the divine nature a supernatural creature? No. So... St. Gregory calls out Barleum here, and he says, uh, "You earlier you said that it was a creature, and now you're saying it's uncreated. And then he says that uh, if you were consistent, you would adopt atheism, because absolute divine simplicity actually cuts God off from being imminently present in this world. Exactly. It removes the imminent energies of God, and it makes God a cut off being who only interacts through created effects in this world. That's what every Thomas will tell you. Yeah, okay, if that's the case, then that leads to atheism. We don't actually know, we never interact directly with that God. And in fact, all we have are created analogs, which are supposed to tell us these different attributes. How do you know if you're experiencing mercy as opposed to foreknowledge, as opposed to justice, as opposed to love, as opposed to punishment, as opposed to wrath? You don't. So you never know because this God is cut off from this world. If all we ever experience is created effects, how is there an incarnation? A real incarnation. The second person of God had really became incarnate in time and space. He's not just a created effect. It's not just a notional virtual incarnation. It's not just a conceptual incarnation. That's why you're a heretic. God is wholly present in each energy. And therefore, there is not parts to God. Next, he moves on to dealing with the fact that St. Dionysius says the essence of God has no name. God is divinity, and that unity, that power is beyond our conception. 
and therefore it itself has no name. We do not know the essence of God. Even when we say God is uh, super substantial, God is a super uh, essential one, we are not naming that essence, he says. Those are just still energetic t- titles for God. Even the name one and even the name essence is an energy. Because what it signifies, we don't know. We're not saying that they're confused. We're not saying that essence is energy. We're saying that we only know that God is one essence because he's revealed it. So if we say that the grace of God that we get is a created light, he says that is an impiety. That would mean that we aren't really deified. We're just given another creaturely substance, another creaturely accident. I don't care. It doesn't matter whether you say it's a created substance or a created accident because the point is that it's a creature. All right, this was the other bumble that Mathema tried to play gotcha on, and it actually functioned to get him, and that's why he crumbled this last week. St. Gregory goes on to say, If the Father is the sole cause and monarchia of the Godhead, as Barliam admits, which, by the way, some of the Thomists don't even admit this. If you go and listen to the Dr. Feingold debate, he was lost when I said this, which is common parlance amongst all the fathers for the first eight centuries. Barliam admits that the Father is the sole cause. Uh, then Gregory moves on to say, then distinction does not entail division because he's the cause of the Son. And that implies a real distinction between Father and Son. And Barlaam says, yes, uh, it is a real distinction, but that doesn't mean that the essence of God is composed. (laughs) And at this point, St. Gregory says, yeah, exactly, right? And so he goes then to St. Athanasius. He says, St. Athanasius teaches a distinction between essence and energy, page 61, and therefore there is no absolute simplicity. He says that God's actions are not his essence, and God's Uh, referring to God as he or to his existence is not identical to his essence. And he cites St. Athanasius in multiple places there to prove that that is so. Again, let me once again send you the essay where we have the argumentation proving, the many, many citations proving that Athanasius does not teach absolute divine simplicity. Athanasius' entire argumentation against the Arians is predicated on there being a real distinction between God's nature and his will and counsel. And that is proven definitively. And that same argument that Florovsky makes is right here. Uh, We have then a litany of essence energy uh, distinction citations. I tweeted many of these out yesterday. Uh, he then launches into this litany of many of them. One of them, let's, let's, let's read a couple of them. Uh, Athanasius says, the, uh, God being God is second to his essence. Did you hear me? God being God is second to his essence. Gregory says, if the judgments of God cannot be discerned in any way or searched out, and the promise of good things transcends all conjecture founded upon the queries, how much more is the divine nature higher than all the things that are said about it, and on account of it, unnameable and unapproachable? St. Basil says, when all of these activities, which are the activities of the Spirit, they are unnameable due due to their greatness and, and innumerable because of their multitude. For how can we think that what is above the ages and the, uh, 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 which were his activities before the intelligible creation. Did you hear that? Which were his activities before the creation. How many of are are those graces which flow from him to creation? And what is the power of those in relationship to the coming age? Hence, even when you think something about above the ages, even that is lower than the spirit himself. So God's actions are not identical to who he is. Would then that the essence of God, which is above all names and unutterable, uh, abound around which are the powers and energies which are also before all ages, right? And he elsewhere he distinguishes the energies that are eternal from all time, such as the glory of God, the love of God, to the energies that relate only to space and time, right? Creating the world. And that's dealt with at length in the triads. And again, this is all straight from Easter Fathers. Then he moves on to talk about uh, grace itself. He says, uh, if... If we are deified, then it has to be supernatural, does it not? 
and Barlam says, yeah, I, I would agree with that. Right, and so if grace is supernatural, then it cannot be identified with natural. And Barlam says, I agree. He says, are created things natural? He says, yes, in this sense they are. Well, then if it's supernatural, it has to be uncreated. And Barlam says, yes, I would agree with that. Then, therefore, grace is uncreated and not a supernatural created substance. Exactly. He says that if we participate in the, un, in the glory of Christ, again, he said that then that signifies a real participation in uncreated grace with the very life that God has. Yes. He says that that is uncreated. Next, he moves to proving this again from St. Basil and uh, not letter 234, but actually from a different letter. This is letter 189 where St. Basil says, but either you call the nature of God divinity and then the nature of the three is one, or you call the energies divinity and then the, act, the energy of the three persons is one. Correct. So there, once again, is Basil make the distinction between essence, energy, nature, will, person. They're all distinguished. But does that mean that distinction entails division? Are we saying that God is made up of these 10 parts? No, of course not. He's not made up of 20 parts. He's not, if he has infinite energies, he's not made up of a million different energies, right? Doing different actions, creating the world and walking on water doesn't mean that he has two different parts there. There's two different actions. Next, he goes on to talk about the fact that the um, many uh, energies are not abstract. They are in hypostatic, meaning that they are personal, right? And then he says, uh, the fact that there's a distinction does not mean that they're divided. God is not composed because there's a distinction between his actions and his essence. And he, he proves this by saying that, look at the seven spirits of God, right? We have this statement from Scripture, from Isaiah, and then from the Apocalypse, the seven spirits of God sent out to the seven churches. He says, uh, are those created or uncreated? Barlam says, those are the spirit. They're uncreated. And he says, yes. Uh, and then what does he cite? He cites what I just cited last night or the other night from St. Maximus. So Maximus says in that section that the seven spirits are the uncreated energies that God transfers to the church. He says, when we say that the seven spirits of God are present, that they're real differentiated actions of God, the works of the spirit, he says, does that mean that God has seven parts? Is God divided? Is the Holy Spirit divided into seven because there are seven spirits? Of course not. And he says, do you think that they're really different? He says, does everybody have the same gifts in the church? No, right? And in 1 Corinthians 12, when Paul uses this term energeia in the Greek, he says that the Spirit distributes many gifts, and he says there's many workings of the Spirit in that text, many energeia of the Spirit, and yet one Spirit. Does that negate the distinction? No, right? So one person can have the gift of tongues, which is from the Spirit, and another person can have the gift of ministry and the gift of mercy or whatever. Are they all the same? No. Are they the same spirit? Yes. So then, therefore, you can have distinction that's real without division or composition. 1 Corinthians 12 is abundantly clear. The Greek word is energeia, and the works of the spirit are really divine. They're not created analogs. Next, uh, I want to mention that St. Gregory calls Barlaam stupid and heretical. Now, a lot of people get mad, and they will be super pious, and they'll act like, don't ever say that somebody is stupid and heretical. Uh, St. Gregory just calls Barlam stupid and heretical. There's nothing inherently wrong when it is, in fact, the case that a person is stupid to call them stupid. Now, you should not be mean. It should not come from a place of uh, hatred or, or uh, 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 pride. But if, in fact, a person is being stubborn and stupid and foolish, as the Bible many, many times calls people foolish, which presupposes that you have the ability to recognize when people are foolish. There's nothing wrong with that. And there's nothing wrong with continuing, and nowadays, if we believe this religion, to say that the people who still hold this view are stupid and heretical. Now, being a heretic, of course, requires obstinacy, willfulness, right? It's not, you're not just accidentally a heretic, right? Uh, uh, heresy is a sin of will, not just a sin of ignorance. Now, a person can be willfully ignorant, but that's a different issue. Heresy requires knowledge and obstinacy in our moral theology and amongst the church fathers, right? You can be ignorant and wrong. It doesn't mean you're saved just because you're ignorant. I'm not saying that either. But I'm saying that uh, a heretic in the parlance of the church fathers, in canon law and so forth, is a person who demonstrates obstinacy. That's why Paul says, reject a heretical man 
after the first and second admonition, right? Paul doesn't say reject everybody because everybody's a heretic, right? He says reject to, to Timothy, a heretical man, after the first and second admonition. That's why what you see me typically do is when people are obstinate, obtuse, ridiculous, I don't interact with them anymore. Uh, you, there's a, we will interact initially. We'll have a time period. If you are obstinate, I move on. And I don't interact with you anymore. And so Basil, or excuse me, Barleum, according to the Synod, according to St. Gregory Palamas, is called stupid and heretical. David Bentley Hart is stupid and heretical because he's literally repeating what Barleum says. He says that there's no distinction. Palamism is not different from Roman Catholicism, even though Roman Catholicism is literally what Barleum says. And I can therefore say that David Bentley Hart is stupid and heretical. St. Gregory Palamas moves on then to uh, emphatically stress again that the seven spirits of God in Scripture do not necessitate that the spirit is divided up into seven parts. It doesn't mean that the spirit has seven persons. He's not seven hypostases, but that there really are distinct differences. There are differences in these seven spirits. Next, we have the uh, allegation of uh, actus purus, that God is pure act. He is his existence. He is his essence. And uh, Barlam falls back on saying, well, again, if there's a distinction, then it must mean God is composed of parts. So he just kind of like, just like a Roman Catholic, just repeat. It doesn't matter what you say. You say all this stuff, and then they just fall back into saying, yeah, but God doesn't have parts. Well, that would mean God's composed. Distinction does not entail composition or division. That's, that's where the argument goes next. Distinction does not entail composition or division. Father, Son, and Spirit are distinct. That does not entail composition or division. Even Luke was admitting to me that Aquinas admits nature and person are distinct. Yes, he does, but he contradicts himself. That's the point. So if nature and person are distinct, God's will is distinct from his essence and from the person's. These are real distinctions. Does, this, does, does the fact that they're distinct mean that God is divided up into parts? Nope. And that's where the word inhypostatize comes into to focus here. Inhypostatize, all that means is that the, the, the mode in which nature always exists is in persons. Right? It's always instantiated in persons. There's no abstract human nature. Human nature always is in the mode of persons. Right. There is a universal human nature that you and I, we all share, but it always exists in the mode of some person. It's in me, it's in you, right? And it's common, we all share it. And in the same way, in God, there's a common unified nature, right? But three persons. Now, the mode of being that God has is different from the mode of being that humans have, right? So even though we're saying that there's in hypostatized for both God and for, and for humans, God doesn't exist in three separate humans, right? It's not, it's not like three different beings, right? We believe in the Father as the source of unity because he communicates that divinity to the Son and to the Spirit. And also each of these three persons indwell one another. So the Father fully and perfectly indwells the Son and the Spirit. The Spirit perfectly and fully indwells uh, the Father and the Son, et cetera, et cetera. If you identify uh, the existence, person, and essence of God in a real sense, all as if they are perfectly simple, St. Gregory then moves on to say that you will be an atheist, and this position will end in atheism. And the fact that we call God one does not mean that he's undifferentiated. If you believe in actus purus, you should be a modalist. He says, how many times have you heard me say that? How many times? Now, somebody will say, yeah, but John of Damascus, this is what uh, next uh, Barlam moves then to say, yeah, but wait, wait, wait. But John of Damascus says, God is not composed of substance and accident. Gotcha, bro. Now, look how stupid this is, because not only does John of Damascus say, of course, God is not composed of substance and accident, but that's because the uncreated energies aren't accidents. Right? They're not accidents in God. Uh, and John Damascus goes on at great length from book one, using the argument for essence, energy, distinction there, 
to applying it to Christology. And every one of these Thomas, especially Mathema, are completely dishonest because if they would read the work, they would know, they would see that he uses the essence energy distinction in book one to apply that to the Christology and the energies in Christ in book three. The energies in Christ, right? And there's a, they come up with a million different objections. He's not talking about energies in God. He's just talking about energy in general. No, this section is about the energies in Christ. What a bunch of liars. So Barlium pulls the, the trick that all the Thomas pull, which is that, well, John Damascus says God's not composed and he doesn't have accidents. Correct. And the energies are not accidents. Now let's look at another uh, argument that Dr. Taylor Marshall has used, uh, and he's relied on this. I refuted this argument in a comments debate 10 years ago, and he still uses the same dumb argument. I, po I refuted this in the lectures on John Damascus. Uh, Taylor Marshall says, yeah, but... Uh, Basil says God's essence is one. Of course, it's his essence is one. He says God, uh, uh, St. John Damascus says God's energy is one. Therefore, absolute divine simplicity. You dishonest person, read the book. The book doesn't just say God's energy is one. It says God's energy is one and multiple. They love to do this. They, they quote hunt and rip it out and ignore the entire context. They do it with Athanasius, where they ignore the fact that the entire context of the debate is about God's actions being distinct from his nature. They do it with John Damascus, where they pull out the quote where he says that God's energy is one, and then they leave out the part where he later says God's energy is also multiple. They set up the dialectics all the time. Oh, by the way, we want to add a little addendum here, which uh, refutes the modernists and the ecumenists, where... St. Gregor Palamas in chapter 35 launches into a lengthy discussion, well, one page, that the scriptures are inerrant. They do not contain errors. They are God-inspired in every respect. They do not have theological errors. They're not historically inaccurate. And you have to believe this. I have stressed this over and over and over. You can't believe that the scriptures are, are, have errors. Next, Gregory Palamas stresses again, the person-nature distinction is similar to the distinction between the cause, the father being the cause of the son. Now, he's not saying they're the same, but he's saying that we believe in a real distinction between person and nature in God. If we didn't, we would be modalists. We also believe in a real distinction between father as the sole cause and the son as caused. Right? That is a real distinction. That is a real eternal generation. That is a real distinction between Father, Son, and Spirit. He says, therefore, distinction is not composition or division. He then goes on to cite St. Athanasius and St. John of Damascus at length in multiple places in this regard. Next, he re-emphasizes he re re St. Basil's arguments from letter 189 about common energies uh, signifying common nature. And then he goes on to make the argument that if you were consistent, you would be a modalist and a eunomian and that Eunomius was more consistent than the Roman Catholic because Eunomius believed in absolute divine simplicity and said that if there's any distinctions and the Son is really distinct, then he is not the same essence, and he would compromise the perfect unity of God. That's Eunomius' argument. Eunomius is more consistent than the Roman Catholics. Eunomius says, I'm a modalist because if I admit that distinction entails division and composition— and if I admit that the Son is distinct, then he's not of the same essence as the Father. He's some other kind of being. Next, uh, St. Gregor Palamas cites St. Basil in Against Eunomius, chapter 1, section 8, where uh, St. Basil says that the simplicity doctrine, where you unite all the energies and actions in God, and I say that they are identical to the essence, is absurd. But once again, Taylor Marshall and all these people are dishonest, or they're ignorant. Uh, next, he says that you believe that in the resurrection, you will actually see the essence of God. Uh, he says that's called the heresy of the Messalians, who believe that they saw the essence of God. Next, he says that when Paul saw the divine light in Acts 9.3 and Acts 22.6, that was not a creature. Paul actually saw Christ. Next, he moves to the famous letter of St. Basil, letter 234, where Basil, in one page, argues for the essence energy distinction very clearly, saying that if you believe that all these are identical to the essence of God, you are a fool. And he says that 
St. Basil can say this and still believe that God is perfectly holy, one, and united. We all participate in God in different ways, showing that distinction is not division. Right? So he gets Barlaam to, the Barlaamite to admit this. If God is pure essence and that we do really participate in God, then it would lead to pantheism. Correct. St. Gregory says. He then restresses the fact that 1 Corinthians 12 says that there are different energeia, different energies of the spirit in 1 Corinthians 12, and those energies are actually and truly different. Therefore, they are not identical, and they're not merely created effects. They are uncreated. God is then multiple in a unified way and unified in his multiplicity. Did you hear that? God is unified in a multiple way and multiple in a unified way. That's the orthodox doctrine because we don't believe in dialectics and we don't believe in the stupid heresies of Barlaam. They are called stupid heresies. Now, if they're called stupid heresies by St. Gregory Palamas, can we then unite with the Roman Catholic, Mr. Ecumenists? No, we can't. If they're called stupid heresies, then obviously they're different views. Next, he quotes St. Maximus. St. Maximus says that the saints get the same uncreated energy that God has. And that is, let's see where that is. The saints get the same energy as God, 145. That is from St. Maximus. Uh, it's in two places. It's in the letter to Marinus, 91, and it's in On Problems, section 91. If you believe that you see God, you have the doctrine of the Messalians. We as Orthodox believe in divine simplicity. We do not believe God is composed. He's not divided. He doesn't have parts. Uh, and he says that I will solve this dilemma for you. The divine is one. It is simple. God has one essence. That one is an, is an, is that one is in an appropriate way. Uh, a whole, W-H-O-L-E, in relation to all things that we think about it. God is not divided. He's not split. He does not have parts. For it is then a whole goodness, a whole wisdom, a whole justice, a whole power, uh, just as we, as we experience him, he's saying. He says, we think about God this way. It is, this, it is this in our thoughts. He says, but it, is not, it does not become this because of, because of our thoughts, in other words. It really is this. Not even when it is thought, but because it is such from all eternity. Did you hear that? What does the Thomists say? What do the ecumenists say? They say that St. Gregory Palamas says that it's a conceptual distinction. It's not real. It is not this because of our thoughts. And even when it is thought, it is not this but it is this from all eternity, because this, these attributes manifest themselves through his works. Right? So God is one in his many works, and he's also multiple in his many works. There is no dialectical tension between the one and the many in God. We don't set the essence of God over against the multiplicity in God. We don't set the multiplicity in God over against the essence of God. He's not more one than he is three. He's not more three than he is one. He's perfectly one, but he's also genuinely three. Next, he quotes St. John Chrysostom uh, to the effect that the deifying grace that we get is an energy of God. And that energy, in, or in order to deify us, is not created. We are not deified if we are only giving another, if we are given merely another creature. Salvation is not the giving of another creature to us, but the uncreated to us. That's how we become immortal. That's how we have eternal life. Eternal life is not just created life. It's eternal life, you see. Next, he talks about uh, the angelic nature and how uh, even that is created. Makes some more distinctions between uh, human nature, angelic nature, but then he talks about how the being of God is different. 
The book then ends with the Barlaamite admitting that he was uh, incorrect, especially after dozens of citations from the church fathers on the distinction being real. Um, and he says that those who are haters of this and haters of St. Gregory Palamas were in fact actually envious and jealous. There you go. So that is the summation uh, of the dispute with Barlium, the debate with Barlium. Uh, clearly, the ecumenists are incorrect. This is not reconcilable with Thomism. Clearly, Barlium says all the same stuff as, as Aquinas. Clearly, after this period, the Roman Catholic Church adopted the Barliumite type position across the board. I don't just mean on propositions about what simplicity is. I mean about God's simplicity. I mean about Christology. I mean about the Filioque. I mean about created grace. I mean about the sacraments. I mean about the beatific vision. And I mean about no doctrine of the noose. That's the critique. And by the way, the papacy itself is also an outworking of divine simplicity. The imbalance of the one and the many in the Trinity in the Roman Catholic conception has led to the doctrine of the imbalance of the one and the many in the church. It's exactly why they have a super mission, because they have a super essence. A super essence that's absolutely simple. All right. Um, all right, so we see that the ecumenists are wrong. We see that it's uh, he calls the heretics stupid uh, and heretics. And, he, and then the last point that we wanted to make was, once again, in the different essay of Father Florovsky, uh, the essay called St. Gregory Palamas in the Tradition of the Fathers, uh, here we have the explanation of why this is dogmatic. So I'm going to put that in the chat there. There is the other uh, essay. And let's look at one of the, a couple of the quotes here from Florovsky. St. Gregory begins with the distinction between grace, essence, uh, and energy. The divine and divinizing illumination of grace is not the essence, but the energy of God. Right? The basic <clears throat> distinction was formally accepted and elaborated at the great councils of Constantinople, 1341-1351. Those who would deny this distinction are anathematized and excommunicated. Did you hear that, ecumenists? You cannot deny this. Did you hear that, David Bentley Hart? Fordham, you're, you're, you're excommunicated. The anathemas of the Council of 651 were included in the rite for the Sunday of Orthodoxy in the Triodi Triodion. Orthodox theologians are bound by this decision. Do you see that? Therefore, we cannot unite with Thomism. The essence of God absolutely is incommunicable. The source and power of uh, of human theosis is not the divine essence, but the grace of God, the inner Gaia. The divinizing energy by participation of which one is divinized is a divine grace. It is no way the essence of God. Charis or grace is not identical to the usia, the essence. Right? Divine grace is an uncreated grace and energy. The, this distinction, however, does not imply or affect division or separation. Here is one of the greatest theologians of the 20th century in the Orthodox Church, Father Florowski, saying what I've, you've heard me say 500 times. Nor is the uncreated grace an accident. Do you see this, Thomas? He's telling you what I've been telling you, but you don't listen. Energies proceed from God and manifest his own being. The term proceed simply suggests a distinction. Right? We're not talking about the eternal procession of the Spirit here. It's just using it in, in a general sense here of coming from, but not a division. Uh, the grace of the Spirit is different from the substance and yet not separated from it. Now, what Roman Catholic believes this? Maybe some of these uniates, but so what? The rest of their church rejects this. And let's read this. St. Gregory quotes St. Cyril of Alexandria. Can you see that? But St. Cyril at this point was simply repeating Athanasius. What have you been hearing me say? The essence synergy distinction is Athanasius' argument against the Arians. If you don't get that, you're a fool. In his refutation of Arianism, he formally stressed the ultimate difference between the essence of God, or the phusis, the nature, substance, on the one hand, and the will on the other. 
distinction between will and counsel, if you read the other essay where he covers this, right, and the essence of God. This is why the Son is not a projection or a result of the Father's will or energy or work, but is in fact a direct offspring of the Father's nature. Uh, That's my quote. Uh, Indeed, not a necessity of compulsion, no fatuum, but a necessity of being itself. God simply is what he is. God's will is eminently free. He is in no sense necessitated to do what he does. Therefore, creation is not identical to the, or the act of creating is therefore not identical to the essence of God. The essence of God is what it is by necessity. If creation, if the act of creating is identical to the essence of God, then creating the world is just as necessary as the essence of God. This is stupid. That's why Basil calls it stupid. Uh, and so he then cites the section where the this is dealt with uh, in Contra Arianos against the Arians, uh, where he ca- he talks about the energy of the will being distinct from the nature. Athanasius teaches the essence energy distinction. There you go. Now shut your mouths. Of course, this distinction does not compromise divine simplicity. It is a real distinction. It is not just a logical device. Can you hear that, Thomists? Can you hear that? Can you hear that? St. Gregory was fully aware of the crucial import uh, importance of this distinction. At this point, he is a true successor of Athanasius and the Cappadocians. And so are we, and you are not. All right, there we go. Uh, very clear. Um, now I will be taking questions. Uh, the next half of this, we will delve into the quotes that he uses from St. Maximus. We'll delve into the uh, Logi, right? It's time to return to the Logos Logi distinction in St. Maximus, the exemplars and how the Orthodox view uh, believes them to be created, uh, excuse me, uncreated energies, uncreated thought wills, we call them, uh, and not exemplars in the essence of God, like the Thomas say, because that would lead to an, a necessary creation. Uh, so there's that, and I'll take your super chats. Uh, if you want to subscribe, you can go to jasonalysis.com. You'll see the members subscribe to become a member uh, for all of the archives and the part two talks. Uh, so if, you want, if you're interested in St. Maximus and his uh, uh, statements on the Logi, how the Logi are also uncreated energies, how he cites St. Maximus, that's what we'll talk about in part two. I've had many, many, many requests for uh, more on this from Maximus, so that's what we're going to do in part two. But because of the, the recent debates and controversies and, and events, this was very timely, um, both against the ecumenists and the Roman Catholics, to, to show the distinction of the position. Um, so I wanted to make that whole book public in terms of the discussion. We'll get into the deeper stuff with Maximus and the Logi in the second part for subscribers. Uh, I'm going to put the link in to the chat right now. If you want to subscribe to Jay's Analysis for that, you can do that over at my website there. You can subscribe by PayPal or credit card. Um, you can also get my book. There are two books on philosophy and film. I'll start Hollywood 1 and 2 there for you. And to subscribe... Here is the link at the top for the tab to subscribe to the website if you want to subscribe. So there's that. Uh, you can also do it through Patreon if you want to. Um, and tutoring. Tutoring is available through Patreon. All right. Let's get to some of these Super Jets. Hunter, 2399 pounds. Uh, as you asked, thank you for asking, Hunter. Appreciate that. Hollywood Decoded 2 uh, is not going to happen, unfortunately. Uh, it was not, uh, they, they did not want to purchase another season. And I don't think our other TV show uh, is going to be purchased either, but that's okay. TV shows come and go. There will be uh, more futures, I'm sure, for all that kind of stuff. And Hunter again says it's a shame. It is a shame. It would have been nice to have uh, Hollywood Decode Season 2 or uh, the other show that we were going to do, Pop a Culture. would have been cool. Um, maybe we can... Uh, Maybe those will still get picked up. You know, you never know. Uh, Shale Windy Eight Four Ninety Nine. Jay, I'm new to Orthodoxy, and the only church near me is Greek. I've been going to the liturgies and was wondering what I should be wary of or ask the priest about. Uh, well, I mean, you don't have to ask him questions to see if you're wary. I mean, you should be able to get a feel 
for the church for you know going there for a while to see if it's if it's good or bad. Um, but uh, I mean, if you want a simple test question, you could just say, uh, "Do you believe in uh, higher higher critical approaches to the Bible?" <laughs> Uh, and do you believe and accept Freemasonry? Those are two good test questions. Um, and if he says that he believes in higher criticism, uh, then you know you have a modernist. Uh, or if he says he is f- cool with Freemasonry, then you know that you probably should find a different one. Air Juan, non sequitur, five pounds. Doesn't the change in the change in the tropos of the sun imply a change in the hypostasis? Is the hypostasis divine or divine human? What does the anthropos mean? Again, uh, I feel like I know who this is. Um, I would uh, let me, you know, what, let me just get John of Damascus out for you. And I actually went and read the sections, uh, the to- all the sections that I think you know who you are sent to me. The first thing I will say is that if you look at uh, how uh, in hypostatize is used in the philosophical chapters, you will notice that in chapter 29, he talks about two different senses to the way that this term is used. Sometimes it's used to just talk about the way that human beings are, and sometimes it's used to talk about the individual in itself. In itself. Did you hear that? In itself. Now, <clears throat> if you move over to chapter 41, he will tell you what it means that what the hypostasis becoming composite means. One compound hypostasis made from two natures. The very thing I told you the whole time. The hypostasis is personhood, correct? Right? It's pre-eternal. Right? So Jesus was a, 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 a person from all eternity. Right? What he assumed made him composite. But what did he assume? A nature, right? He's composite because he has two natures. One compound hypostasis from two divine natures. Excuse me, from two natures. Two diverse natures, he says. One human, one divine. You see. So I am not denying that he's composite. And I don't have a problem saying that the hypostasis is the subject which is composite, but it's not the hypostasis itself because as both John Damascus and St. Maximus say, he, rem- he, he is a reference to hypostasis, personhood. He remained in himself what he was. He remained what he was when he assumed human nature. There was no alteration in the hypostasis itself, in itself, because it's from all eternity. Now, when we move on to chapter 43... He discusses person. What is hypostasis, right? And he talks about uh, operations from the hypostasis. And he says that one should know that the Holy Fathers use the term hypostasis, person, and individual in the same way. So, for example, Peter and Paul are hypostases, right? But they have one common nature. Then he goes on to discuss in hypostaton or in hypostatize. He uses it in the damn same sense that I told you that it means that the only mode or tropos in which nature exists is in the mode or tropos of person. What is called in hypostatize is that which has assumed another hypostasis, and in this it has its existence. Thus, the body of the Lord, since it never subsisted of itself, not even as an infant, is not a hypostasis. The human nature is not a hypostasis, right? That would be the stories. But it is in hypostatized because the divine person is the hypostasis. The body of Christ has as its personhood the divine person of the Logos. And this is because it was assumed by the hope of... St- Look, here, again, here it is, 44. Why, why does Christ's humanity not have any hypostasis of itself? Because it was assumed by the hypostasis of God the Word, and this subsisted and does have this for a hypostasis, right? So the hypostasis of the body of the word is the eternal second person of the Godhead. The only person there, the only person that's present is the second person of the Godhead. Now you said, uh, and we can go over, by the way, in chapter 66, where he expounds in hypostaton again. The two natures are what become hypostatically united, but... 
They are absolutely indivisible. I told you that. I believe that. We don't mix them. And you're a heretic for calling me. You're, uh, uh, you're bad-willed for calling me a heretic, saying that I'm a monophysite. And by the way, I don't want your money. He goes on in chapter 66 to say that the, uh, the hypostasis of Christ assumed an additional nature. And he talks about the controversies about uh, St. Cyril. He says that in Christ, because in him the divine and the human natures are united, right? So he becomes composite because he has two natures, right? The hypostasis itself remains what he was. It, in terms of he, remains. <clears throat> The hypostasis is subsistence in self. He says this in this section. This is section 66. In Christ, the divine and the human natures are united, while his animate body subsisted in the pre-existent hypostasis of God the Word. His animate body subsisted, and it, its mode of being, its existence, is uh is in the pre-existent person of God the Word. He's not saying that the body of Christ existed from all eternity. He's saying that the body of Christ uh, subsists in the pre-existent hypostasis of God the Word. This body has this logos for a hypostasis. It is, however, quite impossible for one compound nature to be made from two natures or from one or for one hypostasis to be made from two. Did you hear me? It is quite impossible for one compound nature, that would be monophysite, to be made from two natures or for one hypostasis to be made from two. Therefore, it's not composite in itself. It is composite in the sense of having two natures. The hypostasis of Christ possesses a divine nature from all eternity and he united himself to a human nature. The humanity, the human nature, has for its hypostasis the second person of the Godhead. It is quite impossible for one compound nature to be made from two or for one hypostasis to be made from two. And then he goes on to say that the hypostasis is subsistent in itself. It must further be known that in the Holy Trinity, a, hap a hypostasis is the timeless mode of each eternal existence, right? So each person uh, exists in a eternal hypostatic mode. That's not modalism. I, I know that you know that, but some people might mishear me and think that I'm talking about modalism. And then uh, he also refutes this in... There's a section in... I made a note about this. We shared it in the chat. Let's see. There's a section in the defense where he talks about this as well. When he talks about the who the hypostasis is from all eternity and how. The only sense in which it's composite is the two natures. He, he suffered no alteration or change in who he was, except that he became composite in assuming a nature, right? Human nature. And by the way, how stupid is it to call us monophysite when I sit here spending countless hours arguing about two energies in Christ? There's no way to be monophysite and hold to two energies in Christ because energies are properties and faculties of nature. If I was monophysite, there would be one energy in Christ. I wouldn't be defending. I wouldn't have giant stacks of books that deal with uh, diothelitism. Um, by the way, uh, speaking of Christ's comp uh, composite after the incarnation does not mean that we continue to view him as, as if he were separate. He is the God-man. There is only and for all eternity, one God-man. 
that's why uh, St. Justin Popovich's works are so good is because he consistently emphasizes the, the God man. But just like it's not wrong to talk about the theological controversies and, there, and therefore to talk about Christ as preexistent and Christ as having two natures, as this book does, dummy, it's not wrong to speak that way. Uh, so let's see, the section that is in the defense that deals with this is where he talks about Cyril and the energies. Uh, this would be section 11 of book 3, where he talks about what, in what sense the incarnation and the union happen, um, how to understand Cyril. Dude, I wouldn't be sitting here quoting, look at this. If my intention was to undermine orthodoxy, I wouldn't be citing the guy who the Monophysites don't like. This is so stupid. Uh, so anyway, I may just write an essay on this because multiple sections in the, what you're not understanding is what it means to say that he's a divine person from all eternity, right? The preexistent eternal word, right? Uh, I understand what you mean when you say he was complex. Or he was simplex beforehand, and then he was complex because he assumed a human nature. So sometimes you can talk about the hypostasis for the whole person of Christ, and sometimes you can talk about the hypostasis referring to it in itself. That's not dividing Christ. That's not saying he's he has parts after the incarnation that we want to divide him. It's using the theological language that he uses, okay? So what you misunderstood was just simply the terminology. You misunderstood the fact that saying the hypostasis is composite does not mean the hypostasis itself is composite. He remains what he was from all eternity. Both he and St. Maximus say that when they explain it. Anyway, I'm not interacting with you anymore anyway, so... The Anthropos is explained in book three to mean what I'm telling you it means. Justin Stam, $10. Yo, dog, could you clarify Exodus 33, 11, where it talks about distinct attributes, glory, and goodness? Seems to be different in translations. Um, well, of course, I mean, as you know, the Septuagint is the normative text for us. So... Let's see what Exodus 33. I don't think that, uh, I mean, the point was to differentiate God's essence from his actions and that the story of Moses tells us this. Uh, so let's see, let's see what 33, 11 says that Moses spoke face to face. Okay, so you're saying that distinct attribute glory and goodness, 3311. All the people saw the pillar of the cloud and the tabernacle, and they worshiped each man at his tent door. The Lord spoke face to face with Moses as a man speaks to his friend. Then he would return to the camp. But his servant Joshua, the son of Nun, a young man, did not depart from the tabernacle. Okay, I mean, maybe I'm missing the... I mean, I know he, he tells Moses that he will let his goodness pass before him. So let me look at what the Masoretic text would read there. 3311? I know, I'm not seeing that. Maybe it's different between the Septuagint and the Masoretic text is what the issue is. So the Masoretic text says, So God, the Lord spoke to Moses face to face. Um, yeah, I don't see where you're talking about the difference between glory and goodness. Um, it's, it's, you know, in the Moses story, it, it talks about Moses says, let me see your face. And God says, you can see my goodness. So sorry, Justin, I'm a little confused. Uh, Misty Ernst, $1. Thank you, Misty. Appreciate that. Op, Oplaton? Oplaton? Uh, 
the hypostasis itself is from all eternity, by the way. Uh, this is what, all we have to do is to read this. The only sense in which it's composite is because his hypostasis has appropriated and taken on a human nature. The human nature has for its subject the, the eternal divine person. Right? So in no sense is Christ a human person. His humanity does have for its subject a divine person. And St. Maximus is very clear about that. But when you read this book, which is a refutation of monophysitism, it makes all of that very clear. And by the way, I'm banning you because I know who you are. And I don't want your five dollars. Shauna, Shauna, Shauna Sawyer, 10 bucks. Bless Jay for explaining original Christianity. How and how the theology practices devolved from the time of the heresies, the Franks, the Great Schism, the Reformation, Renaissance, Vatican II, New World Order. Yes, that's the key. Uh, it's 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 a, a big picture, and that I think is the correct analysis. Steve Green, five bucks. What is meant by accident in this context? Well, in the Aristotelian conception, you have um, the notion of objects being composed uh, of substance or an essence, and then they have accidental qualities, which are maybe secondary qualities, right? So a chair has chairness, but then it has these secondary or accidental qualities, such as being red uh, or being uh, short or being small or, you know, whatever. Those are uh, uh, qualities that aren't necessary to being a chair, but whatever chairness is, that's the essence of being a chair, right? So in Roman Catholic theology, they will adopt the uh, substance accident approach of Aristotle and then try to kind of apply this uh, across the board. And then when they apply it to the deity, they say, well, uh, God cannot, God has pure, perfect, simple substance. And therefore, if he has distinctions that are real, then it must mean that he has accidents and accidental qualities. And that can't be because that would mean he's composed. So... Uh, it's a category mistake where we don't apply the Aristotelian categories to God himself. Now, when I say that, I don't mean that we can't speak of God as the cause, right? If I say God is the first cause, that doesn't mean that I believe that he is the uh, thought thinking itself of Aristotle, right? Uh, if I say that uh, God is Logos, that doesn't mean that he is uh, uh, identified with Marcus Aurelius's uh, principle that permeates the universe it's not the same thing so we can't make category mistakes or uh, word mistakes word term mistakes right mistaking words for the concepts uh, but what happens in roman catholicism is that they assume uh like with john damascus when john damascus talks about distinction between god's energies and god's essence they say that uh, it can't mean what orthodox say because john damascus says that god has no accidents correct uh but John Damascus, as you just saw, Father Florovsky say, does not conceive of uh, there being accidents, that, that the accidents are uncreated energies. Right. Uncreated energies are not accidents in God. Um, slobber chops, 10 bucks. God bless you, Jay. Thank you, Slobber chops. Much appreciated. Bruce Bronson, $1. Bruce Bronson, $1. Thank you. So once again, uh, yes, the uh, hypostasis of Christ is composite in the sense of now he, he exists and subsists with two natures. The hypostasis itself is from all eternity, and it is, it is the pre-eternal word of God. He's a person. He's a hypostasis from all eternity. The only thing that he assumed was a human nature. He remained what he was, both John Damascus and St. Maximus say, in assuming human nature. Now he is the God-man. Now those natures are not compounded. They are composite. Composite does not mean compounded and confused. You are confused. I'm talking about the psycho who keeps following me and gets banned. That's who. I'm not going to name him. Uh, he's done. We're not interacting with him ever again. All right. So... Uh, The only reason he asked that question was to try to trip me up so he can try to have some kind of dirt, but we've already settled the matter with that guy. We've gone above his head. Um, my work has been blessed 
now by uh, the hierarchs, so it doesn't matter what he says. All right. Um, I don't see any more super chats. Uh, do we have anybody who wants to debate? Anybody want to come on and debate? Also, we covered that composite issue again in my chat. Uh, it's just a category mistake. They're misunderstanding what's composite. Uh, yes, the hypostasis is composite in the sense of, of assuming human nature. Two natures is what makes it composite. Islamic Janissary go and debate. Uh, so we have a Muslim who wants to debate. Yeah, we have Muslims debating all week in the in the Discord. Uh, by the way, I'll be debating uh, Matt Dillahunty uh, August 8th. So uh, if you've not, I'm sure most of you probably know who Matt Dillahunty is, the now well-known atheist. He did a debate with uh, JBP a while back. It was very popular. People are saying, don't bother. No. Uh, yeah, John Damascus says there's two senses to which we use the word in hypostatize or what we're referring to when we talk about hypostasis. Sometimes we're talking about humans. Sometimes we're talking about God. Sometimes we're talking about the whole being and sometimes we're talking about just the hypostasis itself uh no christ as a divine person his divine his divinity is impassable so when he was crucified he underwent death the the there's only one person one subject there who, who is undergoing this action but because he's a divine person he is impassable, right? His divine nature is impassable. John Damascus covers this at length at the end of book three and at the beginning of book four. So at the end of book three, he talks about the death and descent of Christ into Hades, his human soul descending into Hades. And at the beginning of book four, he ends that section and he explains what we mean. So the only reason that uh, you Islamic apologists are saying that is because you think that, that Christ is just like kind of one entity. We say that Christ always possesses two natures and that when he suffered and died, it was only his human nature that suffered and died. Now, the subject who underwent that actions is the second person, the Godhead, right? the only person present for all those actions. No, I'm not dropping the Discord link into the chat because there'll be a million retards that will pile in there and junk it up. Um Jay, Paul says in Timothy that God is immortal, but he died a human death. So he, yeah, this is called dialectics, right? God is immortal, but he, that's why we say he took on a human nature. He didn't become human. He remained divine and he assumed a human nature and those natures interpenetrate one another, but they never lose their properties, right? So his humanity really did suffer, die, but his divinity is impassable, right? So he was never separated from his humanity, as John Damascus says. Look, just read the, the last look. All right. This will actually be helpful because a lot of people make a mistake on this, this point. This will also help refute that moron that was just in here. All right, so let's go to book three, and I'm going to put up the screenshot for you here. <clears throat> so this will respond to your question, what we're saying here. Let's take the death of Christ as, a, as an example. Now, we never separate Christ as if we actually, in reality, are dividing him, okay? He's always the God-man. Even in his death, he is the God-man. For all eternity, he will be the God-man, right? But there was a death that occurred. Uh, now, John Damascus is going to make clear that when Christ died uh, in this, what he calls the appropriation, this is right after the section where he talks about, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? The Father did not forsake him in the sense of splitting the Trinity because he's a divine person. Um, but Christ's death was real. It, it wasn't a phantasm. It wasn't imaginary. Well, how do we make sense of that? How can he die, right? Well, Because you're, you're thinking of Christ as one compound thing, right? One, he's only 
divine. He's not. He's divine and human. So let's read this. The word of God then itself endured all in the flesh, right? So the second person of the Godhead, right? The word of God then endured in it, in it's then itself, by the way, he speaks of the second person of the Godhead itself, just like I told that retard who says he doesn't. Uh, there it is right there. He, the word of God itself, right? The second hypost- the second person of Godhead, the eternal hypostasis, endured everything in the flesh, while his divine nature alone was passionless and remained void of passion. Christ has two natures. This is what you don't understand. So God didn't die in the sense of his uh, divine nature changing. For since the one Christ, who is compound of divinity and humanity... Oh, oh! by the way, did you see that, retard? What's he compound of? Divinity and humanity, right? Two natures, compound. The very thing that you said was monophysite. Get out of here, you retard. And exists in divinity and humanity. He truly suffers. He exists in... In exists, his hypostasis exists in humanity and divinity. It truly suffered. What truly suffered? He did in his humanity. In the part which was capable of passion. What part was capable of, of suffering? His humanity. I'm not talking to the Islamic guy as the retard. I'm talking about the guy who's been obsessively tweeting, and or, uh, uh, not tweeting, following me that I had to go to the hierarchs about... Um, this, this right here refutes him as well, by the way, he's so stupid. He thinks that talking about the different natures after the, the incarnation divides Christ when this whole section is about the different natures and what, what was impossible and what suffered. This guy's a clown. Um, but the only part that could suffer Mr. Uh, Muslim was the, the, the humanity, right? Now, he doesn't have parts in the sense of uh, being a divine person, right? He's the second person of the Godhead from all eternity. He assumes human nature, and he does suffer, but he suffers in his humanity, in the part of him that could suffer, right? So Christ himself does not have parts, but when he assumed human nature, he became composite. Compound of divinity and humanity. Compound of divinity and humanity. That's not monophysite, retard. Um, for the soul, indeed, since it is capable of passion, shares in the pain of suffering of a bodily cut, though it itself is not cut, but only the body. But the divine part, which is void of passion, does not share in the suffering of the body. Christ's divinity is impassable. His divinity was not changed. It didn't suffer an alteration. It didn't die. Observe further that we say that, that when we say God suffered in the flesh, this is called communicatio idiomatum. This comes from St. Cyril, and it just means that we can say one thing about one nature, but we can apply it to the whole Christ. That's what communicatio idiomatum means. But we never say that his divinity suffered in the flesh or that God suffered through the flesh. For if when the sun is shining upon a tree, the axe should cleave the tree, and nevertheless the sun remains uncleft and void of passion, much more will the passionless divinity of the word united in, in subsistence to the flesh. Subsistence here just means person. Uh, the one, the, the, the uh, divinity of the word united in the subsistence in in his subsistence to the flesh right his divine person is united to the flesh that is his human humanity his human nature it remained void of passion when the body undergoes passion and should any one pour water over flaming steel it is that which naturally suffers by the water i mean the fire that is quenched but the steel remains untouched for it is not the nature of steel to be destroyed by water much more than when the flesh suffered did his only passionless divinity escape all passion, uh, although abiding inseparably from it? For one must not take the examples too absolutely and strictly. Indeed, in the examples, one must consider both what is like as unlike. So he's just saying these are analogies with the steel and water and fire, heat, whatever. For if they were unlike in all respects, they would uh, be identities, not examples. And then he goes on to say, concerning the divinity of the Lord, how it remained inseparable from the soul and the body at Christ's death, and that his subsistence continued to be one. This is also going to refute that retard even further. Our psychopath. Not the Muslim guy, the other guy. So continuing, he says, Since our Lord Jesus Christ was without sin, uh, he was not. Uh, he committed no sin, as Scripture says, right? He was not subject to death, since death came into the world through sin. 
right? They had another so-called true Orthodox clown trying to say I was a heretic because I said he assumed the nature that Adam had. That's what John Damascus says right here. He was not subject to death, right? But he willingly took on our mortal condition, but not because he inherited original or ancestral sin. He took on himself death on our behalf, you see. He will to. And he made himself an offering to the Father for our sakes. For we sinned against him, and it was meet that he should receive the ransom for us, and that we should thus be delivered from the condemnation. God forbid that the blood of the Lord should have been offered to the tyrant, right? So he's saying that it wasn't an offering to Satan. Wherefore, death approaches, and swallowing up the body, talking about Christ's body, as bait, death is transfixed on the hook, or excuse me, the Christ's body, he's saying, is debate. Uh, the bait is transfixed on the hook of divinity, right? So the it's almost like the if you think about the Matrix when when uh, Neo like goes into Agent Smith or whatever and it destroys Agent Smith. Uh, I mean that's a dumb analogy, but <laughs> I don't know. This what pops in my head like uh, when 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 Satan took this into his realm, into the realm of death, so to speak. This sinless and life giving body uh, is the bait, and then. This is the means by which Satan is destroyed, he's saying. After tasting the sinless and life-giving body, it perishes and brings up again all who died of old. He swallowed up, speaking of death. For just as darkness disappears on the introduction of light, so death, so is death repulsed before the assault of life and brings life to all, but death to the destroyer. Wherefore, although he died as man and his Holy Spirit was severed from his immaculate body, Yet his divinity remained inseparable from both. See there? I mean from his soul and his body. So even though his one hypostasis was not divided into two, you see he remains to be one hypostasis when his death, when the death occurs. For the body and the soul receive simultaneously in the beginning their being. The body and the soul, they have one hypostasis, the word, eternal word. He's a divine person. And although they were separated from one another, the body and the soul, that is, by death, you see. Uh, and wait, let's see. So uh, the one hypostasis, that's what subsistence means here, of the word alike is the subsistence of the word and of the soul and body, right? So in other words, there's only one person present, the divine person and the soul and body of the humanity. The only person that, uh, that, that they have is the person of the word. For at no time had either the soul or the body a separate subsistence of their own. That would be Nestorianism different from that of the word and the subsistence of the word is forever one and at no time two you see so that the subsistence of christ is always one that means the subsistence the hypostasis of christ is never composite it is always one it is composite in the sense of having two natures it is not composite in the sense of undergoing an alteration and change it is always one subsistence means person for although the soul was separated from the body Topically, yet hypostatically, they were united through the word. So in other words, even when Christ died and his soul descended, the only person present as his soul descends into Hades is the divine person of the word. They were always hypostatically united in the person of the word. Now let's look at the death and destruction and the descent into Hades. This is a great question, by the way, because uh, this trips up all, all the Protestants. Protestants are all tripped up on this, and they fall into a, bunch of, a whole bunch of heresies on this one. Um, so let's look at this last section. Uh, where's my screenshot? Make sure I got the right screenshot here. Yeah, here we go. Concerning corruption and destruction, corruption has two meanings. It signifies at times all human suffering, such as hunger, thirst, weakness, nails, death, <clears throat> that is, separation of soul and body, so forth. In this sense, we may say that the Lord's body was subject to corruption, for he voluntarily accepted those things. In other words, he was not subject to those things naturally. Uh, he did not accept ancestral sin. He did not accept original sin. Whatever terms you want to use, we don't teach that. Maximus is very clear in Ad Thalassium 21. And that's why he has no gnomic will. But corruption means also the complete uh, resolution of the body. In other words, his body didn't decompose, is what we were saying. 
body Lord did not experience this form of corruption, as David says, you will not leave my soul in Hades, hell, nor will you allow your Holy One to see corruption. Wherefore, uh, the, he talks about two heretics, Julianus and Gaius, thought that Christ's body was incorruptible in the sense, in the first sense, that he didn't experience hunger, thirst uh, before his resurrection, which is absurd. For if he were incorruptible, it was not really uh, the same essence as us. In other words, he didn't really have full humanity. The Gospels tell us that this happened, that he was hungry, he was thirsty, nails, there was wound in his side. But the, uh, if they only apparently happened, then the crucifixion wasn't real, it was a sham, right? We don't believe that. So he's just talking about two errors that we don't accept. The second meaning of the word corruption, we confess that the Lord's body is incorruptible, that is, indestructible, for such is the tradition of the church. Indeed, after the resurrection of the Savior from the dead, we know that our Lord's body is incorruptible even from the first sense of the word. For, In other words, after the resurrection, he doesn't suffer hunger, thirst, weary, weariness, etc. For he bestowed those gifts upon his resurrected body. That's So he deified it, right? Uh, this corruption must put on incorruption. Concerning the descent into Hades, the soul, Christ's soul, when it was deified, descended into Hades in order not that just as the Son of Righteousness, Malachi 4.2, rose from those upon the earth, so likewise he might bring to light those who sit under the about those in, in, in Hades in darkness and in the shadow of death, Isaiah 9.2, in order that just as he brought the message of peace to those upon the earth and the release of those prisoners, he became uh, to those who believe the author of everlasting salvation. So in other words, the gospel was even preached to the dead, as Peter says, so that he might become the same Lord to those in Hades. Every knee will bow to him, those in heaven, those in the earth, and those under the earth. Philippians 2.10. And thus, after he had freed those from who had been bound for the ages, Hades, straightways he arose uh, again from the dead, showing us the way of resurrection. So, uh, we do not say that God in his divinity suffered and died. Uh, that is a mistake in terms of the communicatio idiomatum. All right. Uh, let's see. I don't think there's anything else going on here. Uh, we got one more super chat. John Kalikas, 10 bucks. Are graces divine help towards salvation for rational creatures? Sure. Uh, I mean, they're not just helps, but they're salvation itself. If so, how do they exist before all creation, including creatures they are intended to help? Well, they're not just helps. I mean, that's kind of like the Roman Catholic idea of like God giving you little spankings and, and power boosts or something. That's that's not the, the Orthodox conception. The Orthodox conception is that uh, grace is uh, uh, the uncreated life of God and glory of God himself. So uh, I would say to you, um, John Calicus, just read John 17. That's one of the clearest passages because Jesus says that the, the, the same glory that he possessed with the Father and the Spirit before the foundation of the world, which is obviously an eternal uncreated glory, is the very thing that he intends to give to the saints. So from John 17, 1, all the way down to verse 20, in his high priestly prayer, he makes that, that very clear. Uh, so anyway, all right. Uh, good talk, you guys. Uh, if you want to read more on this, again, uh, everything I'm saying, it's all in defense of the Orthodox faith, especially book three. Okay, so book three is where it really talks about Christology and where he really applies the uncreated energies to Christology. It's where he goes into what the new theandric energy is. It's what he go, where he goes into in what sense Christ uh, is composite and in what sense he's not. Okay, it's, 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 it's all in book three. And this is the second time I've read it in 10 years. I just did an entire lecture series through the whole book. Uh, I know what I'm talking about. I'm not making this up. I'm not inventing heresies um, to those who are so-called orthodox. Uh, and then to those who are Roman Catholics, we want to stress that uh, we are in coherent consistence with the councils and the fathers, and you are not. And that's why you have to become Orthodox. Uh, and so those who are interested in the website, first part two with St. Maximus, you can, again, I'll put the link again here for you, you can join the website or you can buy the book at the shop at the website. Uh, so let's do that real quick. And again, August 8th, Matt Dillahoney. I'll be debating Matt. That should be an interesting debate. There it is to subscribe to the site. And if you would like to buy the books, the signed copies, philosophy and film, all your favorite movies, 
you can purchase signed copies of the book here. Cool beans, dude. All right, God bless you guys. Have a good night. Um, and I will talk to you next time. And part two with St. Maximus uh, and the Logie, that will be up in the next day or two.